Well, we've done it. We're in Ripper Town now. Rips, Rip City. This is what the people wanted. We're gonna bag us a Ripper today. They're gonna slap the cuffs on them. It's been uh, over 100 years. Who better to solve it than the boys? I mean, if we don't, I'm hanging my head in shame if and I'm we never going back to we America. We can't go back to the, no. the States. No. Well, oh. here we go. Any of you seen a Ripper? This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, in our season premiere, we investigate Jack the Ripper, perhaps the most infamous serial killer of all time. Hundreds of suspects have been named for this case, and it has baffled investigators and ripperologists alike for over a hundred years. But it's not gonna baffle the boys. Yeah, and we're ripperologists. We're unbaffleable. That's, that's not a word. I think it's a word. I've done so much research on this one. I'm very, very pleased with the case I'm about to present. I think I've done it. You think this is your white whale? I didn't solve it, but I, I did a good job. Oh, you just, okay. Let's well, do it. You got me all excited. <laughs> The year is 1888. The stage, the shadowy and fog-filled streets of the East End of London. More specifically, the Whitechapel District, an area with a proclivity for violence and crime amongst the backdrop of poverty. But suddenly, a string of murders terrorized the public in a way never seen before. The culprit, a madman with no clear motive, the world's most notorious serial killer. Jack the Ripper. While most believe the Ripper claimed the lives of only five, now referred to as the Canonical Five, others believe the Ripper claimed the lives of up to 11 women. All five of the Canonical victims were prostitutes, as many women in the Whitechapel district had to turn to prostitution as a way to survive. The morbid intrigue is not a recent development. At the time of the murders, literacy was increasing amongst the general population. The murders were covered in the newspaper, and the public became morbidly fascinated by them. In the end, the public was so upset at the failed attempts to identify the killer that the police commissioner and home secretary eventually resigned. What was, so was this like one of the first instances of like sort of a media frenzy around something like this? Because it yeah. sounds like OJ or, or Jean Vinay. Oh, I wonder if they had true crime shows back then. I don't think they did, Ryan. Like little, I could see them having like little sock puppets. Like, you know, like they're doing Game of Thrones. Okay, I could see that. Little puppets, yeah. Yeah, little puppets. I'm, I'm on board with that. Also, touching on the police commissioner, I think this is the first time I've actually seen a police commissioner resign because he was so upset. And that makes sense to me because I've said this before, when there's a serial killer on the loose, you really are just playing cat and mouse with the killer. Yeah. And he's just getting outfoxed by him at every corner. It's your whole livelihood. That could drive you insane. I feel like that would drive me insane. Today, we're going to cover the five canonical victims, and by the end, we'll have examined the most suspects we've ever presented with eight possible killers. Without further ado, let's jump into the timeline. On August 31st, 1888, at 3.40 a.m., the body of Marianne Nichols was found in Bucks Row in Whitechapel. The body was discovered by a man named Charles Cross, who claims he was walking along Bucks Row when he noticed a bundle toward the western end. Another man named Robert Paul approached the body with Cross. Police would eventually arrive on the scene. Marianne Nichols was found on her back, her throat severely slashed, and she was disemboweled. It was determined she had only been dead for about a half hour, meaning the killer was likely nearby when Cross first saw the body. Now, how did they, at this point in time, I don't know what their forensics are like, do, how do they know when what a half hour is? Do they just sort of, like... I mean, he just goes over. Let's yeah. see, that's, uh, that's half hour blood right there. Yeah, that's 30 minutes. Mm. Maybe they had a bloodhound? I don't know. That's not bloodhounds. No, I know. I don't know, I know bloodhounds use to track things, but I... You don't feed them blood and they don't... <laughs> you don't feed bloodhounds bags of blood? You, you feed a bloodhound some blood and, and it, it goes, barks for every minute. And it goes, A positive, <laughs> universal donor. Dead for 30 minutes. <laughs> right now we're at the site of the first murder. This is Marianne Nichols. They found her at the western end of Bucks Row, which is now Durward Street. You could kind of see where it was, like, see that building right there with the white windows? Yeah. We can't go over there because there's construction now. It's a growing city. But just below that, and a little bit towards us, she was found in the gateway of one of the houses that lined this street before. Kind of similar to these 
gateways here. I mean, it's kind of weird to think that they didn't know this was the first of what would be, you know, the most infamous serial killer of all time. One crazy summer. <laughs> On September 8th, 1888, the body of Annie Chapman was found at 29 Hanbury Street. Her body was discovered by a man named John Davis, an elderly resident of the 29 Hanbury Street building. Her throat was cut, and this time, the violence escalated in that the murderer took her womb. So this is the approximate location of the second killing. Annie Chapman was killed at 29 Hanbury Street, but my sources have told me that street actually moved. 29 Hanbury Street is actually over there, but where it approximately happened back in the day was around like the entrance to Truman Brewery, which is like right there. Imagine the pandemonium. Dr. George Baxter Phillips was serving as the divisional police surgeon at the time and proposed the idea that the killer had anatomical knowledge by the manner in which Annie Chapman's womb was removed. That's the first clue. He's a doctor, probably. Probably. Or has basic anatomical knowledge. Later that month, on September 27, 1888, the Central News Agency receives a letter from the apparent killer. It reads, quote, Dear boss, I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. I have laughed when they look so clever and talk about being on the right track. That joke about leather apron gave me real fits. I am down on whores and shan't quit ripping them till I do get buckled. Grand work the last job was. I gave the lady no time to squeal. How can they catch me now? I love my work and want to start again. You will soon hear of me with my funny little games. I saved some of the proper red stuff in a ginger beer bottle over the last job to write with, but it went thick like glue and I can't use it. Red ink is fit enough, I hope, ha ha. The next job I do, I shall clip the lady's ears off and send to the police officers just for jolly, wouldn't you? Keep this letter back till I do a bit more work, then give it out straight. My knife's so nice and sharp, I want to get to work right away if I get a chance. Good luck. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. Don't mind giving me the trade name. Wasn't good enough to post this before I got all the red ink off my hands. Curse it, no luck yet. They say I'm a doctor now. Ha ha, end quote. Ooh, what a I piece mean, of work. Yeah, I, I gotta give it to him though. Jack the Ripper is a very catchy name. This guy had a knack for naming things. He knows his brand. If this was happening today or if social media existed during this time. Oh, this guy would be a Viner for sure. He'd be a like Viner, that. he'd be, he'd have extensive hashtags on every post. <laughs> Insta good, uh, Insta food. Hashtag ripped. <laughs> this letter wasn't released to the public until October 1st, and many believe that it was fabricated by a journalist. But regardless, it made its way to the papers. Once in the eyes of the public, the name stuck, and the killer from that point on went by the now famous moniker, Jack the Ripper. Three days later, on September 30th at 1 a.m., the body of Elizabeth Stride was found on Burner Street by a man named Louis Deemschutz. Only her throat was cut, which led police to believe that the murder was interrupted when Deemschutz approached. Right now we're walking up on the side of the second murder. Elizabeth Stride. She was found by a man right around here. This is now, I think, a schoolyard. Well, a lot of people actually question whether or not this was the Ripper because she, her throat was cut rather hastily. None of the other uh, little tricks that he pulled, no disembowelment, none of that stuff. Almost as if like he was walked up on and he had to run. Yeah, just, ooh, better murder this one quickly. <laughs> yeah, can't do my little, can't do the whole fixings here. Yeah. It was determined that she was dead for 30 minutes when examined around 1.15 a.m. Shockingly, only 45 minutes after the discovery of Elizabeth Stride, another body was found in Mitre Square, just west of the Stride murder. A woman named Catherine Eddowes was the second victim in the same night. Her body was severely mutilated, including her face. Her uterus was removed as well as her left kidney. So only 45 minutes after the murder of Elizabeth Stride, investigators stumbled upon the body of Catherine Eddowes here. Right, like right here? In this general area, there used to be a flower bed here that was kind of, in a way, served as a memorial for her. But this was just, like I said, 45 minutes after a murder had just happened about 10 to 15 minutes away, walking distance. But what's weird is that after he killed Catherine Eddowes here, he went back towards the direction of the first murder. This guy knows how to zag. 
Either that or he just knew the police routes. I think he's just a zagger. So the body is back there. Right now we're walking somewhat near the path that he would have taken away, walking east away from the body. And then we're about to arrive at a site where he dropped one of the only clues he actually left investigators. Ooh. It's here that police would discover one of the few solid clues in the entire case, a piece of Catherine Eddowes' apron found near the scene of the crime. The apron was found by Alfred Long in the doorway of an apartment block near Goulston Street, a nearby street east of the Eddowes murder site. Near this apron, a message was written in chalk that read, quote, the Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing, end quote, a sign of the anti-Semitism that was common in the area. However, the crucial detail of this clue is the fact that it was found east of the Eddowes murder site, in the direction of Elizabeth Stride's murder site, the murder that occurred just 45 minutes prior. This perplexing decision could mean that the killer willingly entered an area that was swarming with cops. Aside from demonstrating the killer's evasive abilities, this could suggest the killer lived in this East London area, as it possibly explains the motive for entering a dangerous situation. Later, a postcard is received by the police department, dated October 1st and written by someone also claiming to be the Ripper with similar handwriting. Quote, I was not cotting, dear old boss, when I gave you the tip. You'll hear about Saucy Jackie's work tomorrow, double event this time. Number one squealed a bit, couldn't finish straight off, had not the time to get ears for police. Thanks for keeping last letter back till I got to work again. Jack the Ripper. End quote. This isn't confirmed, but there is information out there that this postcard was received by the press agency or whoever received it the morning after the night of the double event. The thing being there that's strange is none of the public knew about this double event because it hadn't been in papers yet, yet right. this guy was able to describe what happened in detail. Yeah, because they're not running around. No, no, I mean, there's not like Two twi people got <laughs> murdered tonight. There's not Twitter. Pass, pass it down. <laughs> and they're not playing a giant game of telephone with Dixie no. Cups. This is, there isn't Twitter. So it's possible and quite likely that if the timing of this is true, this is Jack the Ripper. On the 13th of October in 1888, the police spent a week searching every house in the East End's worst slums, but found nothing. On October 16th, a man named George Lusk received a letter. Lusk was the head of the Mile End Vigilance Committee, a group comprised of local businessmen to assist the police. The letter was signed, quote, from hell, end quote, and it was delivered in a box with half a human kidney. The kidney at the time was believed to be Catherine Eddowes' missing kidney. However, it was found to be a prank by a medical student. Wait, so the, the From Hell letter was a medical student? That's disappointing. I suppose, yeah. Because I love From Hell. <laughs> Just that as a sign off. From also, Hell. Uh, this kind of also demonstrates the climate surrounding this. Like right. people weren't like, this is the worst thing on earth. There are people They're thinking, like, well, we can have fun with this. <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny? It's like the ice bucket challenge. <laughs> Let's everybody get involved in this. <laughs> Nearly a month later, on November 9th, 1888, the body of the fifth and final canonical victim, Mary Kelly, was found at 13 Miller's Court in her bed by her landlord's assistant who was seeking rent. This murder was by far the most gruesome as her body was disemboweled and, quote, virtually skinned down, end quote. This is the last victim. It's a little tricky because where there used to be an apartment building is now, as you, as you can see, it's a parking lot or a car park. So we can't really know where exactly it was, but we know it was near the church. We know it was near the Ten Bells pub. So we could be actually uh, at the place of residence of Jack himself. Here's the landlord on the state of the body. Quote, the sight that we saw, I cannot drive away from my mind. It looked more like the work of a devil than of a man." End quote. And with that, we arrive at the end of the five canonical victims. But as stated before, some believe there could be up to 11 victims. With Jack the Ripper's reign of terror, one should wonder if anybody caught a glimpse of this monster. And it would seem that people did when aggregating eyewitness testimonies of those who believed they saw the Ripper. A rough outline of the killer can be visualized. 
it can be assumed that he was between 25 to 35 years old, roughly 5 foot 5 to 5 foot 7, stocky, with a fair complexion and a mustache. Allegedly, he was seen wearing a dark overcoat and a dark hat. The Scotland Yard's Violent Crime Command Team has said that Jack the Ripper, who one could call evil incarnated, could be described in appearance as, quote, perfectly sane, frighteningly normal, and yet capable of extraordinary cruelty, end quote. Sir Meville McNaughton, the Scotland Yard's head of the Criminal Investigation Department in 1903, had a general suspicion of who the killer was. He knew that the Ripper had basic knowledge of anatomy, possibly a doctor, and in McNaughton's notes, he had narrowed his list of suspects down to three names. That being said, due to the overwhelming amount of compelling suspects and the fact that many feel the official three are not the Ripper, we're going to examine eight names, starting with McNaughton's three official suspects. The first suspect was Montague Johnson Druitt. Druitt was a barrister who may have had an uncle and cousin who were doctors. Around the time of his death, Druitt may have been around the age of 40 and supposedly had an interest in surgery. Montague possibly lived with his cousin, who was practicing medicine close to where the Whitechapel murders occurred. It also appears that about a month before the first canonical murder, Montague's mother went insane, and Montague had written in a note that he feared he was also going insane. In his notes, McNaughton adds, quote, from private information, I have little doubt but that his own family suspected this man of being the Whitechapel murderer. It was alleged that he was sexually insane, end quote. After the final murder, Montague disappeared, only to be found dead within four weeks of the last murder. His body was found floating in the Thames River on December 3rd, 1888. I get the sense this is only the first suspect, but I, I have a hunch everyone we look at is going to have 10 things that make them sound like they are definitely Jack the Ripper because London at the time sounds like it was full of insane psychopaths. The second suspect was Michael Ostrog, a Russian doctor and a criminal. Ostrog had been in an asylum previously for homicidal tendencies. McNaughton notes that Ostrog couldn't provide a strong alibi for his whereabouts during the murders. Ultimately, he was not convicted because there wasn't enough evidence linking him to the crime. How does a homicidal tendency work? You just dabble in murdering someone? Yeah, I don't know if that's tendencies. You either murder someone or you don't. I can't imagine there's a half measure there. He only killed a nanny. <laughs> yeah. It was a funny thing when he was 15. The third suspect was Aaron Kosminski, a Polish and Jewish resident of Whitechapel who spent some time in an asylum in 1889 after the last murder. Kosminski would actually reside in asylums until his death in 1919. Kosminski was known for his hatred towards women, particularly prostitutes. According to McNaughton, his appearance matched descriptions provided by the police of a man in Mitre Square, which if you'll recall, was the night of the double murder where the Ripper likely zigzagged between the police. Kosminski might be a name familiar to the public due to the fact that recently his name made headlines due to his being featured in a book entitled, quote, Naming Jack the Ripper, end quote. In this book, Russell Edwards claims that a shawl purchased at an auction contains DNA evidence proving Kosminski is the killer. The shawl was bought under the impression that it reportedly was found at the murder scene on the person of Catherine Eddowes, the fourth Ripper victim. Edwards enlisted the help of molecular biologist Yari Loholainen of Liverpool John Moores University. Edwards and Loholainen believe the bloodstained shawl is connected to Catherine Eddowes, based off of comparison from one of Eddowes' descendants. They also claim that semen on the scarf is linked to relatives of Kosminski. With this discovery, many felt that the case was closed, including Edwards. Which is, what, if it was true, that's the smoking gun, right? You got semen, you got blood. Time to drag his name in the mud? Oh, I like that. You got the semen, got the blood, drag his name on through that mud. There you go. That's not bad. It isn't bad, but let's find out why we can't do that. Quote, I've got the only piece of forensic evidence in the whole history of the case. I've spent 14 years working on it, and we definitely solved the mystery of who Jack the Ripper was. Only non-believers that want to perpetuate the myth will doubt. This is it now. We have unmasked him. End quote. 
So he's confident. He's very confident. But he's also spent a bunch of money and time on this. He's all, I can understand why he's confident. He thought he had it from the beginning. Then he goes to a molecular biologist. That guy analyzes it and goes, yeah, I'd be gloating like a fuckload. Can you imagine yeah. that? Like, you just solved one of the greatest mysteries of all time because you, I mean, you got confirmation that you wanted to hear. But much to the chagrin of Mr. Edwards, that may not be the case. It turns out that the scientist may have made a critical error of nomenclature. Summed up, Dr. Luhalainen identified a mutation in DNA on both the scarf and an Edos's relative named Karen Miller. This mutation was believed to be named 314.1C, a mutation only found in one in 290,000 people, making it very likely it was a match. However, this identification was reportedly incorrect and was not 314.1C, but instead 315.1C, which is a mutation shared by more than 99% of people of European descent. Basically, this DNA could be anyone if true. So it he, went from being, he, it's that guy to it's one of those million people. Basically it was like, oh, the blood in this scarf and Edo's descendant have this very, very rare mutation. Oh wait, I misnamed the mutation. It's actually this other one. You which just hit a wrong. Exactly, he hit a wrong keystroke. And then, oh, all of a sudden 99% of European people have this mutation. Furthermore, Kosminski's DNA was linked to the scarf using mitochondrial DNA, using a subtype that is far from unique. Sir Alec Jeffries, who is regarded as the godfather of DNA fingerprinting, has said that this evidence, quote, needs to be subjected to peer review. No actual evidence has yet been provided. Further adding fuel to the fire of skeptics is the fact that Dr. Luhalainen has yet to publish this finding in a peer-reviewed scientific journal and has refused to answer questions to news outlets, thus making it impossible to verify his and Edward's claims and effectively doing quite the opposite. How did uh, Edwards react to this? Could you imagine getting the call for like, like uh, this doctor having to pick up the phone and be like, oh fuck. Oh, hello? Remember that scarf I told you was a... Why yes, the most famous piece of evidence in the world. Yeah, about that, I think I, uh, I think my pinky may have hit the five when I was trying to hit the four, and it turns out it's kind of useless and proves nothing. So all that smack you've been talking in the press kind of makes you look like a big fool. I've wasted my life. <laughs> The fourth suspect is the notion that Jack the Ripper was actually a female, a theory that Ripperologists call Jill the Ripper. This theory was allegedly a hunch of famed Inspector Aberline as well. The idea that all of the police were on the hunt for a man when they should have been searching for a woman would explain the Ripper being able to slip by without suspicion. Some have pointed out that a midwife would have sufficient anatomical knowledge and blood on her clothing would have raised no eyebrows. Though, it should be pointed out that all eyewitness testimony points to a man. I love this theory. I think it makes sense that a woman would be able to, you know, slide through the crowd in a way that uh, all these stupid police, not stupid police, but all these police would be able to, you know, not pick up on it because they're looking for a man with a mustache. Far cry from a midwife covered in blood. Feels a little too Joss Whedon-y for me. Joss like, what if Jack the Ripper was a lady? The fifth suspect is Prince Albert Victor Christian Edward, AKA the Royal Conspiracy. You know how they say you never trust someone with two first names? This guy's got four of them. So that either doubles that mistrust or it cancels, cancels it out. out. Yeah. Hmm. Four names fuck with me, that's what he said. I'm gonna double, I'm gonna double it. I'm gonna cancel it out. Okay. This theory is often scoffed at but is still perpetuated due to its wild popularity. Prince Edward was known to frequent areas where the victims were found, an activity that led to him contracting syphilis, which some believe drove him to insanity. Some posit this also resulted in Albert having a child with a local woman, and Queen Victoria demanded that everyone who knew of the child to be taken care of. Some believe that the insanity spawned by syphilis drove him to commit the murders himself. Conspiracy theorists believe he was never discovered because royal aides assisted in covering his identity. However, as mentioned before, this theory is mostly regarded as ludicrous as there is no substantial evidence to indicate its credibility. Looking into this, it's pretty clear that the movements of a prince 
let alone or anybody that the, the queen would hire would be able to be tracked. But I also do think they could cover it up. I don't know. I don't, I don't, think, I don't think it's that strong of a theory, but it is interesting. I feel like if you've got the, you got so many things at your disposal, if you're a queen, you probably have guards. I don't know. You get away with a lot. Just grab people off the street. The sixth suspect is famed painter Walter Sickert, a theory mainly posed by the successful crime novelist Patricia Cornwell. After making millions on her crime novels, Cornwell has devoted her time to the pursuit of Sickert as the Ripper. In 2001, Cornwell spent two million pounds buying 32 of Sickert's paintings, letters, and even Sickert's writing desk in one bizarre stunt that was described by art curator Richard Schoen as, quote, monstrous stupidity. Cornwell went full national treasure Nicolas Cage by cutting up a painting in search of clues. Aside from stunts, Cornwell rightfully claims that Sickert was obsessed with the Ripper, which was true. Sickert referenced the Ripper in some of his paintings, even titling one, quote, Jack the Ripper's Bedroom, end quote. Cornwell claims one painting mirrors the body position of fifth Ripper victim, Mary Kelly. She claims another painting mimics the facial wounds of fourth Ripper victim, Catherine Eddowes. There are also reportedly accounts of Sickert cosplaying as Jack the Ripper. You realize this is before cosplay was a thing. I don't even know if Halloween was that big of a thing. Are you kidding me? They had like Carnival, they had Venetian masks, they had a whole bunch of You don't of weird find it strange then. that a grown man is dressing up as Jack the Ripper for fun. No holiday. Okay. This just feels like, you know, when people shame furries and, you know, just let them live their life. If they want to dress up like a pony. Okay, this is the furthest thing from a furry. A furry is just dressing up as like a furry creature because you kind of want to, you have a sexual thing. Why are they so muscular all the time? I don't care about that. Dressing up as a furry animal is a far cry from dressing up as a serial killer. That's but it's fucking like a, weird. It's like a horse with like pecs, right? I think you're getting lost in the furry culture. It's strange. You just said people are I shaming I mean, I'm them. not shaming it. I'm just, I don't understand it. Cornwell also shoots down the notion that Sickert's alibi was that he was in France at the onset of the murders. She cites sketches that place him in London in music halls at the time of at least three killings. By the way, anybody could sketch anybody. Like I could just, that means if I drew a sketch of you murdering somebody back in the day, I could show up to the police station and be like, here it is. Here's evidence that Shane Madej in cold blood killed this woman dressed as a furry. And, and I then, feel like you would do that. And they'd be like, you're right, we've had a lot of reports that Shane Madej is in fact Slap a furry. Slap the cuffs on those hooves. <laughs> However, the biggest piece of her case is the analysis of forensic paper expert Peter Bauer. Bauer identified three of Sickert's letters and two of the Ripper's letters as coming from a handmade paper run of only 24 possible sheets. Basically, the odds of both the Ripper and Sickert both writing letters on a batch of paper that only had 24 copies in existence is relatively slim. And while that is undoubtedly compelling evidence, it should be reminded that all of the Jack the Ripper letters are unconfirmed. I think he probably didn't do it, but he is indeed a weirdo. Yeah, he's a weirdo, but I don't think we need to throw him in jail for it. The seventh suspect is Joseph Barnett who is particularly suspicious as he actually lived with Mary Kelly, the final Ripper victim. In fact, Barnett may have lived in 10 different locations in East London, making him well-versed in the area and capable of navigating back streets. Barnett worked as a fish porter, and it's believed that Barnett was in love with Kelly, According to an issue of the Daily Telegraph on November 10th, 1888, Barnett referred to Mary Kelly as, quote, his wife, end quote, when she was in fact only a roommate. Barnett also disagreed with Mary's life as a prostitute and strived to make money to keep her off the streets. Quote, Marie never went on the streets when she lived with me, end quote. Some theorize that Barnett committed the first murders to scare Kelly off the streets, which for a time actually worked. But when Barnett lost his job, Kelly returned to the street to make ends meet. Their financial struggles often led to fights, and Barnett also disliked Kelly's love of gin. This culminated in one final fight over Kelly bringing home two different prostitutes, an act that Joseph found unacceptable. This fight apparently got violent. Even a window was broken. Shortly after, Barnett moved out, and only 10 days later, Mary Kelly was found dead in her apartment. After the murder, 
Barnett was questioned for four hours, but eventually set free. Having lived there, Barnett would have intimate knowledge of the household, including how to unlock the door from the outside. He was also aware of Kelly's schedule and tendencies. Details from the scene suggest Kelly was killed in her sleep, not by an outsider she invited in. Her clothes were folded by the bed, quote, as though they had been taken off in the ordinary manner, end quote, and she was wearing a nightgown. As a fish porter, Barnett would have crude anatomical knowledge. They posit that he had anatomical knowledge because he was a fish porter? As a known associate of Kelly's, he would be someone local prostitutes knew, allowing him to get close enough for a sneak attack. Reportedly, one newspaper of the time stated that Barnett's friends called him Jack. He also matches the physical description and the psychological profile created of Jack the Ripper by the FBI. And finally, the murders allegedly stopped after Mary Kelly, the last canonical victim. After her death, Barnett would have no other reason to kill anymore now that his lover, who he was trying to keep off the streets, was now dead. I like it. Pretty good, right? I mean, also to me, most of them, frankly, are very circumstantial. This one, to me, while also circumstantial, seems the closest to actual evidence in that he lived with her, they fought 10 days before her death, he was not a fan of prostitution, right. he tried to keep her off the streets. I could totally see him killing people to try and scare her from doing that, right? The I mean, motive here is certainly the most compelling. For sure. Out of all the suspects. And even the access is the most compelling. Mm -hmm. We have a known, this is the only one where I could, I, where I feel like there was a very clear tie between the possible killer and the victim. The eighth and final suspect is the most popular suspect on casebook.org, a site devoted to Jack the Ripper and a place for ripperologists to work together to solve the case. The final suspect is James Maybrick. Maybrick's death coincided with the stopping of the Ripper killings, as he died one year after the murders. Maybrick was an upper-class cotton merchant who resided in an estate called the Battle Crease House in Liverpool. Some would consider this to be a damning detail, as many feel the Ripper was a local man who likely wasn't upper-class. However, it should be pointed out that all the murders were committed on a weekend. It stands to reason that a wealthy cotton merchant would have the ability to travel on weekends, and it is also worth mentioning that he would have the benefit of not killing in his own locale. Though, what makes Maybrick such a popular suspect is what many consider the biggest piece of physical evidence that links him to the crimes. That piece of evidence is a diary reportedly discovered under the floorboards of Maybrick's estate. A diary that is signed, quote, I give my name that all know of me, so history do tell, what love can do to a gentleman born, yours truly, Jack the Ripper, end quote. Also within the diary are reportedly intimate details of the killings. Backing up the diary's authenticity are scientific tests that have confirmed the diary seems to roughly match the era of the Ripper killings. The diary was apparently discovered by a scrap metal dealer named Mike Barrett, and this is where the story begins to lose its footing. Barrett actually admitted that he fabricated the diary, only to recant the statement later, chalking it up to not wanting the publicity as he was going through a failing marriage. Also shaky is the definitive details of the discovery of the diary. Some sources have it falling into Barrett's hands via being handed down by various generations of family, while other sources have Barrett discovering it himself, or Barrett's associates discovering it and then giving it to him due to their knowledge of Barrett being an aspiring author. However, all that aside, if the diary was in fact found under the floorboards of Maybrick's estate, it is a very strong possibility that he was in fact Jack the Ripper. Following this discovery, a gold pocket watch was reported as potential Ripper evidence. The watch apparently contains the scratched initials of the five canonical victims, in addition to the phrase, quote, I am Jack, end quote, and also, quote, J. Maybrick, end quote. The scratches were analyzed via electron microscope by Dr. Stephen Turgus, whose study suggests that the scratches were not done in modern times. Another doctor named Robert Wilde at Bristol University's Interface Analysis Center concluded that the scratches, quote, could have been very, very old and were certainly not new, but it is difficult to be precise, end quote. 
the watch, which was displayed in a Liverpool jewelry shop by a college caretaker named Albert Johnson, is dated 1846 and was purchased for 225 pounds. But given the circus around the main piece of evidence and Maybrick's far location from the crimes, it's understandable to have doubts of him as the Ripper. Uh, I don't know, I like the other guy better. Barnett? Yeah. Yeah, I think I might too. From like just looking at circumstance, it seems like he'd be the most likely. This guy what? seems like kind of a boring fuddy-duddy. Like a rich guy who's like, well, I guess I'll go into town this weekend and marry Murder. some people. Yeah, like, like he's treating it like playing 18 holes, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I could see that. I think and there's- back for some squash. I, <laughs> I do think these are the two strongest ones. Yeah. And if I had to put money on it, I'd probably say Barnett too. All right. <laughs> you don't seem as convinced as I thought you would be. I thought this was really cool. A <laughs> hidden diary under floorboards, a watch. I know you don't like to hear this. This is sort of like my approach to a lot of these mm -hmm. real old true crime ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sort of the JFK approach. Oh no, approach. I know what you're going to here. No, please don't say it. Let it be a mystery. Oh my. You know? We'll never know. Yeah. We'll just never know. You'd be a very, very bad judge. Why? Because yeah. let it be a mystery. <laughs> Crow is adjourned. For over 100 years, the mystery of Jack the Ripper has continued to fascinate, confound, and infuriate the public. Perhaps one day we will have the means to solve the crime. Or perhaps this famous case will be yet another victim to time. But for now, the age old question will continue to persist. Who was Jack the Ripper? The case remains unsolved. Saucy Jack, truly saucy. Saucy guy. Kind of a douche. Yeah, I'd say, well, I mean, you could say that about most murderers, right? Yeah, they're all douches. You ever think anyone that was someone's last word to a murderer? You're a douchebag, <laughs> Slash. <laughs> all right. This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we investigate the Gardner Museum art heist, the biggest museum art heist in the world. It's also considered America's biggest property crime ever. So, I love it. What do you I, love about it? I love heists, this is fun. Yeah, heists are fun. For the most part, they're, uh, I guess, victimless. You're stealing from largely, what, the rich? I suppose, yeah, I People guess. People who own a lot of marble and oil paintings. Yeah, whatever, steal from them, I don't care. And, and there is like a weird impulse to root for the robbers. And yeah. I don't know what, why that is. Much fun. Well, we'll see who you're rooting for in a second. Let's get into it. Oh shit. Built in 1901, the Gardner Museum houses over 15,000 pieces of art collected by the late Isabella Stewart Gardner. And on March 18th, 1990, the museum fell victim to a historic heist. Though only 13 pieces of art were stolen, the combined value is worth over $500 million. Ironically, at the time of the robbery, the museum was in the midst of updating their outdated security. I can't imagine if I was upgrading my home security and in the couple days that I was doing it, my house got robbed. That happens. Sometimes you lose $500 million. Yeah. I would lose 50 bucks in cash, an Xbox One. I have a, a precious um, a butterfly encased in glass. You have a butterfly in case? Are and you that's, like, that's um, that's weird, right? That's I'm going to head down that road of having a room that's full of um, uh, bugs and, and butterflies, and I want it to look like a... Like a serial killer's den? Is that what, yes, because it's sort of like a, a, a well-traveled serial killer. On the night of the heist, two inexperienced guardsmen were on duty. One security guard, named Richard E. Abbott, was a music school dropout and part of a rock band. He was a rock performer by day and a security guard at the museum by night. By his own admission, he would sometimes show up for work, drunk or stoned after a performance. Quote, I'd be just getting off of the stage somewhere and just wanted to slow down before I went over to the most boring job in the world, end quote. I really respect this guy. I mean, he is a knucklehead, but he's an honest knucklehead. He's not trying to say like, I tried my best. I this is this was my my passion. This job, I took it very seriously. He's very uh, forthcoming with 
Yeah, I didn't really like this job. Because how often does a heist happen? It truly must be the most boring job in the world. Though, Abbott insists he was sober the night of the robbery. Around 12.54 a.m., a half hour before the thieves had successfully entered the building, a fire alarm went off on the third floor of the museum. When it was investigated, there was no fire. Whether this was part of the thieves' scheme is unknown. At 1.24 a.m., two men dressed as policemen buzzed into the security desk where Abbott was stationed. The men stated that they were responding to a disturbance call and demanded entry. There were St. Patrick's Day parties happening in the neighborhood, so a disturbance call made sense to the security guard, Abbott. Also, Abbott added that he wanted to avoid getting arrested because he had tickets to a Grateful Dead concert later that day. This guy has all the correct motivation. <laughs> I love that he says he's high all the time, except for this one day. He's like, yeah, I'm always stoned. I wasn't that day. And that his priorities, I know that he's got a fucking dead show to go to. And here's the thing. If he was this forthcoming with police officers who may charge him for criminal offenses, uh -huh. I have to imagine he was this forthcoming in the job interview. Oh, for sure. So it's almost on the museum themselves for yeah. hiring this man. Abbott buzzed the two policemen through the employee entrance, violating museum protocol. Then, one of the men said to Abbott, quote, you look familiar. I think we have a default warrant out of you. Come out here and show us some identification. Abbott was tricked to leave his control desk, which has the only button that would immediately alert the police. He was then instructed to face the wall and stand spread eagle. Abbott recalls that as he was being handcuffed, he found it odd that he was not frisked beforehand, and it dawned on him that this could be a robbery. I don't know if these two robbers were as bright as they seem, but it is interesting to point out that they knew that the only button to alert the police was at that desk, so they knew they had to get him away from it. Yeah, it's very good. It's ticking all the boxes so far because not only do, are they have they clearly done their research, or at least happened upon a very... They may have cased the joint. Yeah. Um, they got costumes. I'm picturing just the whole crew, like a guy up on a telephone pole. Oh, yeah, There's yeah. always the guy on the telephone pole. Like they have a lookout and all that stuff. Is there a guy on a telephone well, pole? We'll get into how this God, guy carries there, there better be a guy on a telephone pole. We'll see. At this time, the second guard arrived and was also arrested. The second guard asked why he was being arrested, and the men replied, you're not being arrested. This is a robbery. Don't give us any problems, and you won't get hurt. The guard responded, quote, don't worry. They don't pay me enough to get hurt. I'm not taking a bullet for some rich person because they wanted to jaunt around the world and have their art shown. I'm just realizing now how fun it would be to bond with the robbers. I'm, I'm kicking back with these guys. The heads, hands, and feet of the guards were tied with duct tape. Motion detectors in the museum show that the robbers then went to the second floor and split up, removing various pieces of art from the walls. During the heist, an alarm went off. It was meant to alert guards that someone had gotten too close to the artwork. The robbers found the alarm and smashed it. Okay, so this is why the security in the, in the building was flawed. The, uh, the alarm just goes to the guards, and the only way the police are alerted is because- As if the guards press, press a button. The, press the self-destruct button, So maybe have more than two guards. <laughs> they had had a security advisor come in and be like, you gotta change everything. You gotta have a control room where the guards are sitting in to have access to all this stuff. Uh -huh. And they're like, uh, I guess they ignored it for a while. Yeah. And when they finally decided to Oh, do what so are you, some kind of security expert? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. At 2.28 a.m., the robbers returned to the security counter. They made a second check on the guards in the basement. They then removed tapes that captured their movement outside the side door and in other places in the museum. After 13 minutes, they readied for their leave, taking the art to their vehicle in two separate trips. There were witnesses who recalled seeing the thieves near the museum sitting in a red hatchback. A hatchback? Yeah. What, what's wrong with that? Not this all started out with the costumes, and I thought we were going to tick all the heist boxes, you know, like a big rendezvous, maybe a helicopter, some kind of a point where they rip their mustaches off. Getting away with $500 million is disappointing it's to It's still very impressive. There, there you, you just heard her here first. You get away with $500 million, that's cool, but if you don't do it with, with some pizzazz, Shane is disappointed. How hard is it to rip off a mustache? Oh I mean, they also, they even had a moment, a he, really badass moment, where he said, we're not arresting you. <laughs> We're robbing you. Of the 13 items taken, noteworthy pieces included three Rembrandts and bizarrely, a gilded filial eagle from a Napoleonic banner outside the tapestry room. 
they tried taking a fourth Rembrandt, but it was apparently too hard to remove. Skipping to about four hours later, sometime between 6.45 and 8.16 a.m., the two morning shift guards showed up to work, unable to enter the museum, prompting the deputy security director to call the police. At 8.30 a.m., the police showed up and discovered the two night security guards handcuffed in the basement. Despite wearing gloves, which prevented leaving fingerprints, the thieves didn't cover their faces, which let the guards get a good look at them. However, the security guard, Abbott, could not recall what the men looked like when asked by the Boston police. Abbott recalls that the police sketch, quote, was awful, end quote. Though, in 2005, Abbott mentioned, quote, one of them looked like Colonel Klink on Hogan's Heroes. That's all I can remember, end quote. Hogan's Heroes! <laughs> yeah. This guy's the best. <laughs> he seems like the most over-the-top cinematic security guard yeah. in history. Yeah. Like, I couldn't write this man. No, he's a cartoon. Some wonder why the thieves left behind pieces that were clearly worth more, like a Michelangelo and a Titian. And why did they spend so much time trying to take such an obscure object as the filial eagle? I always wonder, what do you do with it? The art yeah. itself? Yeah, because it is hard to you sell, sell it. The black, you can't just pop on eBay <laughs> and be like, I got a few Rembrandts lying around. <laughs> Buy it now at one million. <laughs> Yeah. That doesn't work. You, yeah. you gotta, what do you, sell it to other criminals? Did Saddam Hussein buy stolen art back in the day? I don't know. Well, Does my knowledge Kim Jong Un <laughs> do it these days? I have no idea, man. My knowledge of Amazon and eBay is quite extensive, but when it comes to the black market, I'm pretty, uh, not a lot there. I don't really know how it works. Maybe they do have a buy it now auction. So Saddam Hussein was like, ah, outbid it again. <laughs> Damn it, Kim! One interesting development occurred in April of 1994, when the museum received an anonymous letter claiming to know the location of the art. The author seemed to have a great knowledge of the pieces stolen and the art world in general. The anonymous tipper stated that the pieces were safe in a controlled environment, but the museum had to act quickly because a buyer in another country who was unaware that the pieces were stolen could purchase them and claim legal ownership. The writer asked for $2.6 million for facilitating the return of the artwork. The museum agreed. The museum then received a second letter. The author was pleased they were interested in negotiating, but was discouraged by the local law, state, and federal authorities intervening. The writer openly wondered if they were trying to arrest the middleman on top of recovering the art. They wrote in all caps, quote, you cannot have both, end quote. The tipper also added that even if they see no way of following through with the negotiations, they would give some clues to the whereabouts of the art. They've never heard from the author since. I think they probably knew some details that made the museum think, okay, this is legit. Mm -hmm. So, who knows? Maybe they got cold feet. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's nerve-wracking, <laughs> being the middleman there. It seems like a rendezvous you would have to go to where you're looking over your shoulder the whole time, I looking mean, up at windows. You gotta expect that they're gonna have that, though. You're not handing over random shit. You're handing over $500 million worth of goods. It's a fair amount. So you're gonna expect a couple badges there. That being said, let's get into the theories. The first theory is that a thief named Brian McDevitt was responsible for the crime. McDevitt had committed a similar art robbery in the 80s, where he hijacked a FedEx truck and dosed the driver with ether. Wearing the uniform and carrying duct tape, McDevitt planned to bind museum employees at the Hyde Collection in Glens Falls, New York, and cut paintings from their frames. Hilariously, McDevitt and his accomplices got stuck in traffic and arrived after the museum closed, thus foiling their plans. McDevitt served a few months in jail for attempted robbery. McDevitt also lived about a 10 minute drive away from the Gardner Museum at the time of the heist. He was questioned by the FBI in 1992 and later in front of a grand jury. His lawyer told the Globe that his client knew nothing about the crime. You know, this was no, this was no small change robbery attempt. He did use a costume. He, he did use a costume. He had. So he does have a flair for the theatrics. Yeah, he has a proclivity for costumes. Hmm, I like that. So maybe. Can you talk of mustaches in that one? I didn't look into that. No, well, maybe do a little more research next okay, time on, well, the, on the mustache front. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I'll write that down here. Let me get that pen. Actually, I don't care. The second theory is a classic that the heist was an inside job. This would explain how the thieves knew where the only alarm button was located, and also their knowledge that the artwork did not have anti-theft devices. The FBI claim 
that security guard Richard E. Abbott has not been ruled out as a suspect. The suspicion goes beyond Abbott being poor at his job. As mentioned before, Abbott notably could not recall the faces of the robbers shortly after the heist. I don't know how I would describe your face to someone. I'd just say, yeah. oh, you had a nose, uh, yeah. sort of looks like a cartoon gopher. Yeah, I, if I had to describe yours, I would say, first off, do you have uh, some paper that could fold out? Because you're going to need a lot of real estate to cover this guy's head. Yeah. It's huge. Mm -hmm. it, probably the size of most barn doors. Also, despite the thieves' failure to destroy motion sensor equipment, the motion sensors, oddly, didn't record the thieves on the first floor where a piece was stolen. But that same equipment picked up Abbott's round in that room before the thieves arrived. Abbott also broke security protocol by granting the disguised policeman entry. Museum policy prohibits letting unauthorized personnel, even police, from entering the museum. Abbott states he was unaware of this policy. Yet, this wasn't the first time Abbott had broken protocol. At one of the museum's New Year's Eve parties, Abbott snuck in some friends, which to be fair, seems fairly innocuous. But that doesn't apply to his third break of protocol. A video released two years ago shows Abbott letting in an unauthorized visitor the night before the heist. Law enforcement officials believe this person may have been scanning the area for a dry run. Abbott says he does not remember this visitor, despite being caught on tape. Nonetheless, in 2015, Abbott stated in an interview that he's still angry about that night. Yeah, it's fishy. That's something you would remember. Even yeah. if you're sort of intoxicated or out of your mind, I imagine he wasn't on the job and so high or drunk that he's blacked out. Yeah. I Otherwise, mean, what do you, why are you even going into work? You, you also said it yourself, too, how, how much activity you have at this job at the night shift at a museum. Yeah, nothing's happening. How many times are you getting up other than to go pee and get water? Uh -huh. I think you would remember, oh yeah, I let that dude in. Right. I like that this might be a sort of a Kaiser Sose situation. Where he's, where he's like this stone hip, he's like, I don't know, man. And then he starts walking down the street and his posture just straightens oh, up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He walks home to all his beautiful art. Yes, they fall in for it. Yes, look at my, my beautiful collection. The third theory comes from Dutch private investigator Arthur Brand, an expert in international art crimes. In his impressive endeavors to recover stolen art, Brand has posed as a Texas oil millionaire, a representative for sheiks and princes, as well as a general criminal. In one instance, he negotiated with criminal gangs to recover $25 million of artwork. So, you get it. The impressive. guy gets the job done. Yeah. Unlike our boy Cece, who went to go get the job done and then became a job himself yeah. by missing, going missing. The, this man. Don't worry, Cece's on the case. Oops, uh, I've been murdered. Someone come find me now. Don't worry, help has arrived. <laughs> help! In 1991, about a year after the heist, Arthur Brand acquired images of the stolen artwork in storage somewhere in Holland. In 2010, Brand heard that the pieces were in possession of a member of the Irish Republican Army. After working on the case with the FBI for roughly 12 years, Brand theorizes that the pieces were originally stolen by small-time thieves who sold the pieces to U.S. gang members who then, possibly in the mid-1990s, shipped the pieces off to Ireland to some top-ranking Irish Republican Army commanders. Brand estimates that he can get the pieces back in a matter of months. He will not give details as to why, but believes that the investigation and leads are, quote, making the haystack smaller, end quote. FBI spokeswoman Kristen Cetera stated, quote, the FBI believes with high confidence that we have identified those responsible for the theft, even though we still don't know where the art is currently located. It's not just that they're, you know, they made off with a lot of money, right? Yeah. But if they stole precious Rembrandts, yeah. That's, that's lost. For the culture. For the culture. That's yeah. like someone stealing every copy of Forrest Gump. Yeah. You can never watch Forrest Gump again. I love it that they got as theatric as they could. Would have liked some mustache. You, you know, obviously. You wanted a guy in the light on yeah. the telephone pole. I'd like a guy on the telephone pole. Yeah. But I like that they got in there. They essentially, no victims here. Yeah. Aside from the rich people they stole from, which, hey, look, steal from the rich. Do it. You're a Robin Hood. Be Robin Hood. What's your? Who do you think did it? What's your? Uh, 
I think it had to be an inside job. Yeah. Mainly because the button, knowing that button, which I guess is kind of like uh, something you would assume anyway, there must be some kind of master control button, but knowing exactly where it is, I guess you would guess it's on the control desk, but knowing that they were in the midst of updating security and that there was someone who was let into the museum unauthorized yeah. through a door you're not supposed to go through the night before on tape and the motion detector not really going off. Very fishy. It, it's, it definitely seems like something that would be uh, an inside job, and it wouldn't even be that uh, that hard because no one seems to be paying attention in this museum. Well, if you got any tips, uh, email them to us, and we'll pass them along to the yeah. proper authorities. Yeah. Anthony Amore, the director of security at the museum, commented that stolen pieces are either recovered soon after the crime or about a generation later. For many years, the museum was offering a $5 million reward for information that could lead to a return of the artwork in good condition. And the offer was even doubled to a $10 million reward for a short period, but expired on December 31st, 2017. The statute of limitations for the prosecution of theft passed in the mid-1990s. In 2005, Boston's U.S. attorney said he will not prosecute whoever comes forward with the paintings. Whether that day comes remains to be seen. But for now, the identity of the burglars and the location of the stolen Gardner Museum artwork will remain unsolved. This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we investigate the Cleveland Torso Murderer, one of the most gruesome serial killers of all time. That's a, that's a hell of an accomplishment. He's not the most definitively, but I will say he's one of the most. He's in the upper echelon for sure. It's not a shiny badge of honor on his You resume. sound like you're impressed. I'm not impressed. The things he did were pretty, uh, for lack of better term, gross. Wonderful? Gr gross. Okay. Whatever you say. Between 1934 and 1938 in Cleveland, Ohio, near Kingsbury Run, 13 people comprised of six women and seven men were killed by a serial killer. Of those 13, only three were identified and almost all of them were vagrants or sex workers. All of the victims were decapitated and in some cases, the head was never found. He just killed anybody. You also will see he killed all ages as well. Like this guy just didn't give a shit. He's just deaf. The killer often dismembered the body through the torso, and in no instance was a body found fully intact. These gruesome tendencies would earn the killer the name, the Cleveland Torso Killer, or the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run. Here's a little background on Kingsbury Run. In the 1930s, Cleveland's Kingsbury Run was a bleak, dangerous place where many poor lived in terrible conditions, sometimes called a quote, hobo jungle, end quote. Just east of Kingsbury Run was a sketchy area called the Roaring Third, known for its bars, gambling dens, and brothels. I'm into that. I like that place. The Roaring Third? Yeah. Is that a place you would frequent back I'd in the day? I'd be there. You'd be dead. It's got... He'd see you, he'd see those long limbs, and he'd say, oh man, I got some big ornaments to make here. Bars, gambling dens, and brothels. Yeah. Now, currently, nowadays, I've said this before, but we have a lot of entertainment at our disposal. I've got YouTube, I've got my PlayStation, and pretty much that's it. But back then, not a lot to amuse yourself with. So I would for sure, every night of the week, be down at a bar, a gambling den, or a brothel. So this is part of the recurring theme that you've had throughout the show where if there weren't modern devices, you'd be- I'd be a monster. An insane psychopath. Yes. With the stage set, Let's jump into the timeline of the killings. On September 5th, 1934, the first victim, an unidentified woman in her 30s, was found on the shores of Lake Erie. All that was found was part of her torso, thighs, and other body parts, but no head. Her skin was leathery and red from a chemical preservative. On September 23rd, 1935, the second victim, a 28-year-old man named Edward and Rossi, was found near Kingsbury Run at the base of Jackass Hill. That's that's actually what that's named. I know that was gonna elicit some kind of giggle. Sucks. So just get it. <laughs> Sucks. Just get it out of the way. Sucks to die so, like that. At the base of Jackass Hill. Yeah, where'd they find him? Oh, a base of Jackass Hill. That's not fun. I'm sure they omitted that out of the eulogy. Why even, call, I guess maybe there were burrows there at some point or a donkey. And Rossi was a hospital orderly and a regular around the Roaring Third. 
The body was drained of blood, naked and emasculated, with rope burns on the wrists. On that same day, the third victim was found nearby, an unidentified 40-year-old male, and was also decapitated and emasculated. The body also had the same chemical preservative from the first killing. On January 26, 1936, the fourth victim, a woman named Florence Polillo, was found wrapped up in newspaper inside half bushel baskets by the Hart Manufacturing Building. Polillo was a sex worker, barmaid, and waitress who lived in the Roaring Third. He's getting bolder with the places he's dumping bodies. The first one was the lake, the second one was at, uh, uh, on the side of a hill, the third one was nearby to the hill, and now this one in front of an actual workplace yeah. in, you know, a metropolitan area. On June 5th, 1936, the head of the fifth victim, an unidentified man, was found wrapped in trousers in Kingsbury Run. The rest of the body was found the next day in an even more audacious location in front of the Nickel Plate Railroad Police Building. So once again, he's escalating. Yeah. The, one of the saddest parts of this to me is that so many of these bodies were unidentified. Yeah. Because it's just... I'm always of the opinion that once I'm dead, you can do anything you want with my body. Throw it out in the street, let the dogs eat it. But I, want it, I at least want people to look at my body and go, yeah, that's Shane. That was Shane He's, who's being eaten right now. That's Shane in that Basset Hound's mouth. Give him a send-off, whatever. Say your kind words about him. That'd be a happy or, dog. That's a big-ass bone. On July 22nd, 1936, the sixth victim, an unidentified 40-year-old man, was found in the woods near Clinton Road. The man had been dead for two months. One noteworthy observation was the blood on the ground, suggesting he had been killed on site and not dumped there as indicated by the other body sites. So this is someone who's just out walking around who gets, gets got. Well, the thing that is interesting to me about this is because all the other ones have been dismembered in a way that was medically efficient, most likely done after death. Uh -huh. This is one that seems to be done in the heat of the moment, which either means to me, this is not the same guy, or since it obviously is the same guy, he's, he's getting antsy, he's, he's losing his grip, he doesn't care anymore, he's starting to do things that aren't as premeditated. On September 10th, 1936, the seventh victim, an unidentified man, was found near the train tracks in Kingsbury Run. He had been killed by decapitation in a manner that the coroner noticed was confident in one stroke, which implied that the killer was both brazen and educated in human anatomy. This is gross, but I think it's hard to cut off a head. It apparently is kind of hard. Yeah. And there was one case where someone had, it took them, I forget which royal it was, it was a British royal. Yeah. It took five strokes. Also, another thing, you are slightly alive. There was, I was reading this one recorded case of a guy who watched someone's head get cut off by a guillotine. Yeah. And he said the head rolled around and he saw the guy's eyes. He blinked? He blinked and he saw recognition in the eyes when he said his name. Wasn't what? there an old tale of someone who, for science, told the person getting executed to blink as long as they could? Oh, see, that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Like, if you were a piece of shit your whole life, you're getting executed because you're an awful person. Yeah, the least do, you could do, do this thing for one science, solid man. on the way out. Give us, give us, yeah, a little something. You'd be even better. Not blink. What if they were like, why don't you give us a a wink? Because like <laughs> your vocal cords are gone, right? So, you, but you could wink. You give a little. I mean, wink. I guess a little wink. They, I would ask them to chop it just below the vocal cords, so I could kind of roll over and be like, "Hello, my baby." <laughs> At this point, many local papers reported the murder spree on a near daily basis, and yet, there were no suspects or clues. As expected, this put a considerable amount of heat on the investigating authorities. Detectives Peter Murillo and Martin Zalewski interviewed over 1,500 people on their own. Here's even a picture of Detective Murillo undercover as a vagrant. That is the most cartoonish <laughs> is the most car hobo I've ever seen. <laughs> He looked like he watched a Bugs Bunny cartoon <laughs> in which Bugs Bunny was on the railroad and was like, yep, that'll do. You think he has a couple PBJs in that little bag there? Probably. Maybe this is like accurate to the time. I don't think it was. So you think that he was just like, I bet you this is what vagrants look like. And he went out there and he was like walking around. He's like, Jesus Christ, I don't look anything like him. <laughs> probably. <laughs> there are probably actual people who looked like real 
human beings. Just dirty. And then this guy walking on like he walked off the Warner Brothers set. <laughs> Jumping back into the timeline, on February 23rd, 1937, parts of the eighth victim, an unidentified woman in her 20s, were found on the shore east of Bradenau. On June 5th, 1937, the ninth victim, determined to be a woman named Rose Wallace, was found under the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge. Her remains were merely a skull and a bag of bones. On July 6th, 1937, the tenth victim, an unidentified man in his mid to late 30s, was found in the Cuyahoga River. His heart was ripped out and the abdominal area was gutted. The proximity of the killings are starting to, sh to shrink here. He got to enjoy Fourth of July though, which is my favorite holiday. <laughs> I guess he, <laughs> I guess he did. It's fun, it's a good holiday. Yeah, I suppose if I had to choose between getting murdered on July 3rd or July 6th, I'd choose July 6th. It's that, always a silver lining, that's what I'm saying. It'd be a belly full of hot dogs and brew. Yeah. In April slash May of 1938, parts of the 11th victim, an unidentified woman, was found in the Cuyahoga River. Interestingly, this was the first time that a victim had drugs in their system. This left authorities to wonder whether the drugs were recreational or used to keep her from moving. Maybe this contributes to why the, the strokes were so confident and so absolute. Because they weren't moving? Because they weren't moving. Mm. And the only reason I posit this is because drugs may be involved in one of the case's main suspects later. Okay. A pretty horrifying to imagine that you were drugged and you can only just move your eyes. You ever had that? Is that in a movie? It's That's some... in Wolf Creek. Some uh, yeah. serial killer cuts someone's spinal cord so that they can't move, so they're forced to just watch what's happening to their friend. But their then, eyes can move. But their eyes can move. That's horrifying. It is pretty scary. As all of these gruesome murders were ongoing, Mayor Harold Burden increasingly pressured safety director Elliot Ness to make headway. You may know Elliot Ness as the famed G-Man, who led his illustrious group of untouchables to bust Al Capone's breweries. Other credits to Ness's glowing resume included defeating the Mayfield Road mob, crooked police, and labor racketeers, contributing to his status as a law enforcement legend. As city safety director, Ness was involved with both the fire and police departments, and given his decorated track record, Ness was at serious risk of tainting his reputation should he not make headway on the torso case. With that in mind, Let's discuss the last two killings. On August 16th, 1938, the 12th and 13th victims, both unidentified, were found in perhaps the most reckless location of all. The bodies were found within view of Elliot Ness's office window, a taunt that obviously resonated with Ness. Oh, wow. This fucking That's guy. Bold. You're gonna coast out and you're gonna coast into retirement, right? You know? Yeah. Yeah, everything's great. And at the last leg, this piece of shit comes in yeah. and just starts messing with you. Commits uh, some of the most grisly murders of all time yeah. in your playground. And then he puts it and rubs your nose in it. Yeah. Two days later on August 18th, 1938, at 12.40 a.m., Director Ness and a squadron of 35 detectives and police officers raided Kingsbury Run's Hobo Jungle. They rounded up 63 men and scoured the shacks for any sign of the killer. Most noteworthy, in a move that has been criticized, Ness then ordered the shacks to be burnt down. The people displaced were then charged with being homeless, which they pled guilty for. Ness's involvement in this episode of the investigation has been referred to as cruel and draconian. Okay. This, uh, I mean, he pretty much just said, I can't find what's going on in this part of town. Let's burn it all down. It's a, literally like a scorched earth. He literally went scorched earth. Yeah. According to James Bedell, the preeminent expert on this case, Ness's raid was intended to protect the transients in a bizarre and backwards way. Ness wanted to eliminate the pool of potential victims, thinking that the killer targeted transients, which, to be fair, was true. He also wanted the transient's fingerprints in the event that they were later killed. It feels like maybe the fingerprint excuse is exactly that. It's just an excuse when people are like, hey, why are you uh, terrorizing an entire population of people and setting their homes on fire? 
and suddenly he needed to come up with a reason. Oh, for he's that. coming to his senses. Yeah, like uh, uh, finger. Pr- like it just seems like he's just sort of backpedaling there. He was just like fingerprints. <laughs> he didn't just look finger. He I didn't. Just needed, um, uh, I need fingerprints. That's yeah, what sure. Means. Either way, the killings did stop after the raid. Whether or not the raid had anything to do with that is debatable. Certainly, Ness's shiny reputation was damaged by this action, and it also brought the investigators no closer to identifying a killer. That being said, the case is considered by some to be unofficially solved. And furthermore, the solution was reached partly by Ness himself. With that, Let's get into the suspects. The first suspect was 52-year-old bricklayer Frank Dolajal. In July of 1939, Dolajal was arrested by County Sheriff Martin O'Donnell for the murder of Florence Polillo, the fourth victim. Dolajal had actually lived with Polillo for a time. Furthermore, Dolajal also knew victims Edward and Rossi and Rose Wallace. Following his arrest, Frank Dolajal confessed to murdering Florence Polillo. However, he later said he had been beaten and recanted his confession. In fact, Dolajal had suffered six broken ribs while in the custody of the sheriff, further casting doubt upon the confession. The confession appeared to be coached, as it was a mix of prepackaged details and incomprehensible ramblings. According to case expert James Bedell, the lead detective on the case later said in his memoirs, quote, this is the first time that I've ever known anyone to confess to a crime that didn't know the details of the crime to which he was confessing, end quote. They beat the shit out of him probably. A hundred percent. Yes. And it's very, very sad. Yes. Him knowing numerous people in the camp doesn't seem I mean, he know so a lot were a lot of these people people who lived in that neighborhood or in yes. the shanty town kind of I think what happened is they saw he lived with one of the victims. Yeah. Then they found out he knew the other two victims who were identified. Uh-huh. And they thought everyone's on us right now. A lot of pressure from the mayor. The public is starting to get pissed off. I think it's time to do the deed. Nonetheless, Dolajal remained incarcerated for the crime which makes the event that followed all the more suspicious. One month later, in August 1939, Dolajal committed suicide in his jail cell before going to trial, hanging himself on a hook that was five feet and seven inches from the ground. The problem with that is, Frank Dolajal was five feet and eight inches tall. Logically, how could a person hang themselves from an object that they were taller than? It seems like it may be logistically impossible for him to hang himself from a... He'd have to... You can... I don't know. I think that's possible. It's suspicious to me, given the things that preceded it. They coached his confession out of him. Oh, maybe I they're see. Starting oh so you're saying the police maybe have... Oh, that didn't occur to me that the police would... What I'm saying is they, are, they seem very, very uh, set on this being their guy. Yeah. They've beaten him. They've gotten a confession out of him. They start to think, oh, this is going to go to trial soon. Oh, okay. I did not put that together. In addition, James Bedell interviewed forensic science experts that looked at Dolezal's autopsy. The experts concluded that he didn't end his own life the way people were told he did, though the experts don't explicitly say he was murdered while imprisoned. Either way, virtually no one believes Frank Dolezal was the killer. A marker purchased by James Bedell and his team was laid on Dolezal's grave in August 2010 with Dolezal's family members in attendance that reads, quote, rest now, end quote, thus vindicating Dolezal posthumously. In these unsolved episodes, it's not often that we get nice sentiment. And this... Let's hang on to this one. Let's this really is, savor it. It's really, this is, a, this, is, this is actually very lovely. Rest now, that's nice. That's nice. The second and final suspect we will discuss today is Dr. Francis E. Sweeney. In the 1970s, Sweeney was discovered to be safety director Elliot Ness's secret suspect. Sweeney is also thought to have been the killer according to case expert James Bedell, who as of 2014 had spent 18 years researching the killings. Dr. Francis E. Sweeney fit the profile. He was a doctor and would have had the necessary skill and anatomical knowledge to perform the killings. Sweeney had also been to probate court multiple times, and his wife noted his problems with alcoholism, 
his abuse of her and their two sons, his days-long disappearances, and his neglect of his practice. Shortly after the final murder, Sweeney checked himself into a mental institution, after which the killing stopped. In 1956, Sweeney was diagnosed as schizophrenic. In May 1938, Elliot Ness secretly apprehended Sweeney, taking him to the old Cleveland Hotel. Ness kept Sweeney there for about 10 to 14 days, as it took Sweeney three days to even sober up. Just Ness brewing coffee the whole time. <laughs> I know what is just Slapping him in the face, tossing feeding him buckets coffee. of water in his face. <laughs> Tickling his feet with some feathers, <laughs> I don't know. Miranda rights were not in place yet, though this process was still in conflict with the rules of civil liberties of the time. The inventor of the modern polygraph, Leonard Keeler, administered a lie detector test to Sweeney, which he failed twice. Keeler told Ness, quote, that's your man. I might as well throw my machine out the window if I say anything different, end quote. This makes me wonder if he, in his mind, thought he was sort of a vigilante justice type. You know, because Bruce Wayne was a very successful, very powerful man. Are you comparing the torso killer to Batman? I'm not. It sounds like you're comparing the torso killer to Batman. I'm just saying I think maybe the torso killer thought that he... Is Batman. W ...was a Batman type. Except Batman never cut anybody's head off. Well, that would really ruin it. Yeah, Batman didn't kill people. He just knocked them out a little bit. Mm -hmm. He's not Batman. Ness had to proceed carefully because Sweeney was a cousin of Congressman Martin L. Sweeney. I wonder if this affiliation, along with the detention violating civil liberties, contributed to Ness keeping this lie detector test a secret. Regardless, despite this revelation, Francis Sweeney was released and less than three months later, the final two torso victims were placed within view of Ness's window, seemingly to mock him. Ness would continue to get mocked well after the killings. In the 50s, Ness received taunting note cards from someone claiming to be Francis Sweeney. And since Sweeney was a secret suspect, I would imagine it's likely that the sender was indeed Sweeney. What do the note cards say? They pretty much say uh, nonsense. Do they implicate that he is the killer or is it him essentially just... It's him thumbing his nose at him knowing that even if these note cards were taken to court, they wouldn't, wouldn't mean, mean anything, anything, which is even more inferior. Yeah. Unfortunately, despite feeling he had solved the case, Ness didn't have enough to take Sweeney to trial. Though, the case against Sweeney doesn't end there. In 1938, a vagrant named Emil Fronick told authorities that in 1934, a doctor tried to drug him. He remembered the office was somewhere around East 50th and East 55th on Broadway Street. Unfortunately, when authorities drove Fronick up Broadway, he couldn't find anything that appeared to be a medical office, and from there, his story was dismissed as irrelevant. However, more than 70 years later, case expert James Bedell would discover that Francis Sweeney practiced medicine out of a modest looking building at the corner of Broadway and Pershing Avenue. This building closely matches where Fronick remembered getting drugged. It's in this building that Bedell believes Sweeney could have drugged Fronick as well as other victims. Though, the torso killer murders would have resulted in a large amount of blood evidence. So, how could Sweeney have carried out those murders in these offices without eventually being caught? Spread out your tarps and just whoosh. Because I imagine it would be pretty hard to explain this. <laughs> I know this looks bad. He's got a head cold. <laughs> the answer may lie with David Cowles, the leader of the Scientific Identification Bureau, who was interviewed by the Cleveland Police Historical Society in 1983. Cowles suggests that Sweeney may have had an agreement with an undertaker that he could practice surgery on unclaimed bodies in the undertaker's funeral home. If this is true, a funeral home would function nicely as a way to dispose of blood evidence. This arrangement, however, does seem to be possible as directly next door to Sweeney's office was a funeral home. In fact, 
the funeral home had a concrete ramp located behind the building that conveniently led to the undertaking facilities. Both Sweeney's medical office and the funeral home are a short car ride away from where the September 1935 victims were found, which was not far from the Roaring Third. In Bedell's opinion, Sweeney could have visited bars near the center of town to lure people back to his office with promises of alcohol or drugs. He just made an agreement with them to say, yeah, you can work on our dead bodies, but then he'd bring in some of his own. I think that's what it was. I see, okay. He snuck in some, you know, snuck some of his own in. Some of his sinful, some of his own, his sinful collections. He, he snuck in some of his own critics' picks. Yeah. But Dell, with the help of the great nephew of one of Francis Sweeney's colleagues, was able to use photos and diagrams to compare the torso killer and Sweeney's movements. But Dell calls the results, quote, creepy as hell, end quote. All this information allowed Bedell to conclude that Sweeney was indeed the killer. Though, Bedell cautions, quote, I think I put together a pretty good circumstantial case. I realize you couldn't take it to court. And Ness realized back then he couldn't take it to court. End quote. It's crazy that all he had to do was follow the rules, and it's quite likely he may have gathered some legitimate evidence on the guy, or at least... The thing is, all he had was... Sweeney fit the profile, right? Yes. But that isn't grounds to getting a search warrant for someone or bringing someone in. No. I don't know what the rules are maybe of when you're allowed to arrest somebody or even submit them to something like a lie detector test. Yeah. I imagine it wasn't enough for him to do it when he did it. Yeah. Or ever. Sweeney would have to slip publicly. There are, however, some criticisms of the Sweeney explanation. Police and crime reporter Doris O'Donnell believes that somebody at the funeral home would have noticed something weird was going on. Yet, O'Donnell may be biased, since her uncle was the sheriff who arrested the controversial suspect, Frank Dolezal, in 1939. I think it's like one of those things where you wouldn't even dare to dream that someone would use this as a place to kill people. Right. Because you're around death all the time, all you see is dead bodies. What makes you think that they're gonna be like, oh, I wonder if someone's using this to kill people? Also, even Bedell acknowledges that the medical office setup could have only been utilized for the initial murders before colleagues could become suspicious. He doesn't know where the murders that followed occurred. Others, including lead detective Peter Murillo, believe the torso murders were committed by the same person that committed murders in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. Detective Murillo felt that Sweeney was too overweight to make the rail trip back and forth between Newcastle and Cleveland, which consequently led to Murillo's discounting of Sweeney as a suspect. But to be fair, Murillo had also been kept in the dark about Sweeney's secret interrogation and lie detector test. I, uh, I for one, will go on record by saying I do think it's him. He, I, I will also go out on that limb. Great work, Ryan. That's the best I could give. Yeah. So, well, I guess I shouldn't say great work, Ryan, it's because more, you didn't solve. I this. didn't do anything. James no. Bedell did. Yeah. Regardless, Francis Sweeney remains, for the most part, the most popular suspect. In the case of Elliot Ness and James Bedell, they believe that he is not just a suspect, but in fact, the killer. However, we may unfortunately never be able to definitively prove that. And for now, the case remains officially unsolved. This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we cover the case of the East Doll Woman, one of the most mysterious cold cases of all time. And I know I say that a lot, but not only are the culprits suspicious, but the identity of the woman itself is a factor here. So it's a mystery on, on a mystery. It's a layered mystery. I like a layered mystery. It's like a, a two-layer dip that you have at a Super Bowl party, and you're oh, like, and oh. The where do these beans come from? Oh, what about that cheese? Put a little salsa on top, three-layer dip. There may be a third layer here. I haven't even, I'm not gonna disclose everything. Mm, I'm talking. getting hungry <laughs> for mystery. <laughs> okay. On November 29th, 1970, in the East Dalen Valley near Bergen, Norway, a family on a Sunday hike discovered the body of a woman wedged between large rocks. One of the first people on the scene and the last one living, police lawyer Carl Halvor Ose remembers the first thing they noticed was the very strong scent of burnt flesh. The body was severely burnt and the arms were in a boxer position in the air, common in burned bodies. 
while the front of the body, including her face, was burned beyond recognition. The backside was bizarrely not burned. The officers were unable to tell how long she had been there or when she died. The woman was believed to be about five feet and 4.5 inches tall, aged between 25 and 30 years old. So the front of her is burned, but the back is not. Yes, and she's found on a hiking trail by a family. A family who knows what burnt flesh smells like. Well, that was the description from the police lawyer. Oh, okay. It would smell like barbecue, probably. Probably. <laughs> gross. I mean, barbecue is not gross. No, no, you get what I'm <laughs> getting at. Oh, that, that yeah. we're so sad. We are but animals. Yeah, well, that's true. We are meat. Items recovered from the body and scene included jewelry, a broken umbrella, bottles, a watch, remnants of nylon stockings, and rubber boots. However, oddly, the jewelry and watch were not found on the body, but rather beside it, as if they had been placed there. All of the identifying labels on her clothes had been removed. Even the bottles found with the body had their labels rubbed off. With no clues to her identity, the police began looking for a witness who might be able to identify her. She is referred to as the East Doll Woman. It stinks, man. <laughs> uh, anytime anyone's got the labels removed on their things, it's very fishy, very fishy. I mean, one thing you can infer is it does seem like there was another person that may have been involved. It just doesn't strike me as an accident, nor does it strike me as something she w that was self-inflicted. But why, why do they even? Why do they do that with the clothes? What if I'm a body somewhere? I don't have ID on me, maybe, but they find my pants and go Levi's, huh? This must be Shane Madej. Well, I what? mean, if it's fancy clothes, they could then go to fancy department stores, ask if you've seen this person, then go to the next step of identifying them. But Are they fancy? I don't know. I mean, that's just where my mind goes, but then again, I do have a superior detective mind. I don't so, know about that. Uh, I, I mean, I, I get why you couldn't make that conclusion. It just seems like it, an unnecessary precaution. Or very thorough. An autopsy of the body discovered a large amount of Venema, a sleeping pill, in her stomach, around 50 to 70 pills. Her bloodstream had not fully absorbed them before her death. They also found smoke particles in her lungs, which denotes that she was still alive while she burned. Petrol was also found at the scene near her body, and it was evident that it was utilized in the burning. There was also a high level of carbon monoxide in her system. A strange bruise on the right side of her neck was also discovered. After the autopsy, the death was determined to be a probable suicide due to the sleeping pills and the carbon monoxide from the fire. 50 to 70 pills a lot. is a lot. You could see why they may have thought this may be a suicide, but they weren't fully absorbed by the time of burning. Seems odd to burn yourself. If you're That's taking I'm, 70 wh sleeping pills, why, yeah, why, then are you, why go, are you burning yourself? Let's set myself on fire now. Yeah. If I'm going to die and you say, well, you can go to sleep. You say, that sounds like a good option. Or alternatively, we could set you on fire. Yeah, we could do the thing that's generally considered the worst way to die. Yeah. I think I'd go with falling asleep. Yeah, me too. I think that would be a 99% consensus. Just remember these odd details. I've committed them to memory. Good, good. Lock them in. Throw the key out. Okay, you could swallow it too. Oh. Oh, Jesus Christ. Oops. <laughs> 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 Jesus Christ. <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> Good bit. In fact, the spot where she was found was the scene of many suicides in the Middle Ages and also where some unfortunate hikers fell to their death in the 1960s, thus earning the title Death Valley from locals. The site was remote, difficult to climb, and definitely not a hiking path. Wait, you said this was not a hiking trail? What's this family doing out there? Yeah, I, I considered that first. All right, kids, let's go for a little hike in Death Valley. I guess maybe they want to challenge themselves, you know? Sometimes I go off the beaten path when it comes to hiking. Do you? I'd like to challenge myself mentally and physically. You're gonna die. Not something I would take my young family with. You have a young family? Well, if I had a family, I would not take them and be like, hey, let's go bouldering. Yeah, the people do that in Los Angeles, though. They had to close one of the mountains around here because people kept falling off. LA of people are weird. Yes, they are. Considering the curious state of the crime scene, it's understandable to be skeptical of the ruling that it was a suicide. But before we dig into that, let's first provide some context by attempting to answer one question. Who was this woman? 
The first major clue came three days after the body was discovered when two suitcases were found at the train station in Bergen. Inside the suitcases was a pair of non-prescription glasses with a fingerprint on the lens. The fingerprint was a match to the Eastall woman, effectively linking the suitcases and all their contents to her, which is important since the suitcases contained several mysterious items. Oh, that's fun. So Every she's got some stuff in some suitcases. What goes beyond suitcases, wait till we crack these bad boys open. The plot will thicken, as they say. I like that. You do appreciate a thick plot. I love it. <laughs> okay. Inside the suitcases were clothes, wigs, a comb, hairbrush, makeup, money from Germany and Norway, as well as coins from Belgium, Switzerland, and the UK. A tube of eczema cream was also found in the suitcase, but the prescription label that would indicate the patient and prescribing doctor had been removed. The labels of the makeup had also been removed, and the efforts to identify the brands failed. Beyond these items, there was one item that seemed particularly promising, if not strange, to the police. A notepad with a code written in blue ink. A code that could not be cracked by the police at first. But we'll get to that in a bit. Mm, heating up. I like codes. Well, obviously, one thing to, to glean from that is the fact that the labels were also removed here in her personal belongings. That, to me, means the labels, uh, her clothes, all that stuff that was found in the scene was maybe done by her, not by a, a separate party. Yeah. Which then gets you into the question of who she is. Right. The second major clue also came from the suitcase and was a plastic bag from a shoe store about 130 miles away in Stavanger, Norway. Roar Rortvet, the store owner's son, described blue celebrity boots he sold to a woman about three weeks prior. The boots matched the ones found at the scene. What do they call them celebrity boots? Because they were popular at the time, celebrities were wearing these boots, therefore he described them as celebrity no, boots. I thought he was just sort of a sort of a dumb guy who saw something fancy. Oh no, these were just very popular boots. Look at you with your celebrity boots. Rortvet gave a well-detailed account of her appearance. In summary, she was well-dressed, medium height, with a round face with dark brown eyes, long dark hair, and had a strange odor to her that Rortvet would realize years later was garlic. Why does it take him years to remember what garlic smells like? Yeah, that's a bit odd. I don't know. I don't know if that's like... I smell garlic. I, I jump up. I love garlic. Yeah. It's delicious. Because it always, it smells good when you f smell it coming from a kitchen. Mm -hmm. When you smell it on someone who's just eaten garlic, it's a bit um, funkier. So she just went to chow town on some, some bee yeah. sticks. And then decided, let me go pick up some boots. Breadsticks, boots, <laughs> burning myself alive. <laughs> Holy shit. Rortvet's description led police to St. Svithin Hotel in Stavanger, where the Eastall woman stayed under the name Vanilla Lorch. However, when police checked hotels back in Bergen, no hotel had admitted a woman named Vanilla Lorch. Which brings us to our third major clue, the coded writing on the notepad. It turns out Vanilla Lorch was not the woman's real name. And in fact, she had at least eight names that she used at hotels around Norway. This meant the woman had multiple passports with differing names. Police were able to match up the names using handwriting analysis on the hotel check-in forms and cross-referencing it with the code found in the suitcase. The numbers and letters in the code correspond to the woman's stay in all the different cities. For example, 030BN5 relates to her stay in Bergen from October 30th to November 5th. But do you think that's her way of coding it so someone who reads it doesn't see it? Or is it just her own shorthand for, because, you know, I... If that was all that was found in the suitcase that was odd, I would maybe think, okay, it's just shorthand. Mm -hmm. But the fact that the suitcase also included wigs, she had multiple passports, she used eight different names. I'm just curious. Most people only have one passport, if that. Yeah, I don't think that contributes to shorthand, all those. I have one passport, and I always 
I'm always looking for that darn thing. After examining all the registrations, the police realized she mostly claimed to be from Belgium when she registered, all of which were confirmed to be fake Belgian identities. They also gained insight of the woman's habits by speaking with various hotel staff. For instance, she often asked to change rooms, and she utilized some German and Flemish, as well as English. Additionally, they also described her as well-dressed. So maybe she's just a spy. You just said that like you'd made like a great revelation. I mean, like that's what no, I, I, I mean, obviously it was sitting on the back burner, but yeah, yeah. You know, I'm just moving that pot to the front now. Yeah, now move that to the front, stir it around a bit. Crank it up, watch it boil. Yeah. The Throw some crawfish in there. Yeah. Start licking those lips. Okay. I don't know why we went that direction, <laughs> but. The fourth major clue was the Eastall woman's teeth and tissue samples. For this clue, let's skip forward to modern times when new scientific developments were applied to the investigation. A professor of dentistry named Giselle Bang. Well, that's a cool name. Giselle Bang. Giselle Bang. Giselle Bang. Yeah. That's like a good spy name. I was going to say you could say you've been banged, but that has different it's connotations. Different, different, yeah. different. Professor Bang examined the East Doll woman's teeth, covered in fillings and gold crowns, and determined the unusual dentistry may have occurred in Southern or Central Europe, perhaps even Asia. However, before the location could be locked down, Professor Bang unfortunately passed away in 2011, and the teeth, hilariously, were rumored to have been thrown away because they smelled. Ah, smelly teeth. That's, a, that's an unsolved classic right there. <laughs> let's take the evidence, let's throw it away because I don't like it. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I love it. Yet, this toothy tale doesn't end here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the Eastall woman's missing teeth were later found at Hokeland Hospital in a remote warehouse. Also in that hospital were tissue samples that included the Eastall woman's heart, lungs, spleen, and liver, among others. They found the teeth? Yeah, they found everything in a remote warehouse in a hospital. Next to the Ark of the Covenant? Yeah, next to the Ark of the Covenant yeah, and, to, and to the uh, Cup of Christ. What the hell kind of warehouse is this? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> the Eastall woman's teeth were subjected to an isotope test, which determines where the woman grew up based incredibly on the water she drank. Whoa. That's badass. Yeah. yeah. Using this test, scientists were able to pinpoint an area near the France and Germany border where the Eastall woman likely grew up. DNA testing revealed the Eastall woman was of European descent, possibly from North America, though her poor English would suggest otherwise. By the way, I, would, I just want to point out her poor English, any accent in general, if she's in fact a spy, that all goes out the window to me. Uh, hotel room, me. There you go. You're, you're, See, you're strangely you. European now. What I was getting at is the fact that m the isotope test may have pinpointed her in yeah, North yeah, America. Yeah. She, yeah. she could have very well been American. Well, a funny test if it says either Germany or America. <laughs> <laughs> sort of. Yeah, that's kind of a, a considerable amount of distance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm still very impressed by the test, but not so much the results. Well, she's either from Europe or America. That's, you know, she's not from China. With the Eastall woman's features and background starting to materialize out of the darkness, new police sketches were drawn of her in 2016. Yeah, that's pretty good. She looks like someone from the Americans. Yeah. In May 2017, a black notice is sent out through Interpol with the Eastall woman's DNA attached in hopes to find new leads. And with that, we arrive at the end of the clues. Yet, the question persists. Who was this woman? As some of you might have already wondered, many suspect she was a spy. Let's see if that claim has any weight. Obviously, the case file is quite peculiar, but external factors such as the ongoing Cold War also catalyze speculation that the Eastall woman was in fact a spy. Perhaps connected, Norway was revealed to be home to Russian spies and Mossad agents from Israel a mere three years after the Eastall woman's death. In fact, four Mossad agents were questioned about the Eastall woman. However, none of the agents claimed to recognize her or any of the Eastall woman's aliases. But also, remember, they're spies. What are they gonna do? Why oh would... yeah, I killed her. <laughs> that lady I killed? Yeah, oh, I you, remember her. You wanna know all the confidential details yeah. of my spying? Why don't you ask me in the beginning? That's the thing about spies 
And I think a lot of uh, intelligence deaths like mm -hmm. this, I'd, I would bet that a vast majority of these deaths yeah. are just unreported. I mean, they're professionals. Yeah, I mean, they're made to not exist. Right. So They're ghosts. <laughs> You're trying to catch ghosts, which yeah. is, we, we, we know it's, it's, pretty, it's, pretty, it's pretty hard. Around the time of the murder, Norwegian intelligence agencies looked into the case of the Eastall woman due to the odd circumstances surrounding it. A week after the discovery, Ornolf Tofta and Bjorn Langbake of the Police Security Service began investigating the case. Ornolf Tofta says he was called by the Bergen Chief of Police to investigate whether there was anything connecting the strange case to spying. While their team ultimately decided the death was an accident, Tofta remarks that it doesn't mean the woman was not involved in espionage. He claims her false passports point to the possibility of her being a, quote, illegal agent, end quote. Here's the Bergen Police Crime Commissioner's response in an interview a few weeks into the investigation after being asked about the role of espionage in the case. Quote, we have no proof of that. No, we can safely say. I'd go further to say we've completely eliminated that possibility." End quote. However, the Norwegian Surveillance Agency denied involvement until 2002. No offense to this commissioner, but I feel like spies' methods or the way they cover their tracks or their, yeah. the way their organization may cover their tracks probably going to be a little more thorough to the point where some rinky-dink police officer isn't going to be able to... Above his pay grade, perhaps. Yeah, uh, then again, they did have Norwegian intelligence agencies look into the case. So he didn't do the case investigation himself. He, mm -hmm. he reached out to them to have them do it. But w what is the Nor Norwegian surveillance agency going to say? Yeah, we cooked a lady. Newt Havik, a crime reporter covering the case, says he was given case files to write an article about the Eastall woman in the 1970s. In the files, he found an envelope containing a cassette tape. However, the envelope was marked with a warning that said it should not be opened without express permission from the supervisor. As such, the envelope was never opened, and I can find no record of what was on that tape. Well, why didn't they open it? That's one of my questions. Well, I'm gonna listen to uh, some ink. Yeah, I'm gonna listen to a fucking yellow sticky when it comes to yeah. that far in the case. No, come on. Crack that thing open, bust out your Walkman. It better be padlocked because a yellow sticky ain't stopping the old Bergmeister. I'm tearing right into it. He's doing an investigative article. Yeah, he's an investigative crime reporter. And, and he, he just stops at a... because someone tells him not to? I guess so. Oh, one would make a real, for a real yeah. thrilling movie. Some, <laughs> sometimes... No, he, we heard about this thing at Watergate, but they told us not to look into it, so... <laughs> Sometimes you gotta play by the rules, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, as further proof that the Eastall woman may have been a spy, her habits and situation were also suspect. Just to recap, she had multiple passports and used fake names. She had wigs, wrote in code, and all identifying labels and marks on her belongings were scratched off, either by her or by somebody else. She also seemed to have quite a bit of money to dress so well, travel to each country slash city, and then afford all the hotels that she stayed in. Other than that, there's nothing concrete. It appears the Eastall woman is as elusive after death as she was when she was living. All this considered, we now return to the original question. How did she die? Let's get into the theories. The first theory is that it was a suicide, as originally determined. Returning to the autopsy, 50 to 70 sleeping pills were found in her stomach. Officials see this as a sign of suicide, as it would be hard to force someone to consume that many pills in multiple doses. Though, due to the odd details surrounding the case, many, including officers involved, doubt that suicide is the true answer. You could make somebody swallow pills. You point a gun at them and you say, swallow these pills. Then, if you know someone's either going to shoot you in the head, or you could, again, fall asleep. Okay, sure, but logically, let's go through that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to have you swallow 50 to 70 pills. Yeah. Then I'm going to set you on fire? Sure. <laughs> How does that make sense? Yeah, it's a little fishy. Also, if it, let's go through it as if it was a suicide. Okay. She goes, I'm going to swallow a shitload of pills. A lot of pills. Now I'm going to set myself on fire. That doesn't make any sense either. Doesn't make a ton of sense. Unless the pills were a backup, like she thought, oh, maybe if I set myself on fire, it's not going to work. 
Unless she's just not in her right mind, she takes the pills. She's sure they're going to work, but they haven't worked yet. She need, she's concerned they're not going to work, so she goes for the fire. I don't know. She's I not, just I, there's an oh, when you consider the the fact that the method of death doesn't really coincide with suicide, and that she had all these other external factors that maybe suggest she was involved in some weirder things. Mm-hmm. Doesn't seem to me like a way of committing suicide. Also, a spy suicide seems like, wouldn't they have like a fucking cyanide pill? think you'd be pill? better at that, yeah. Cyanide pill. I'll tell you one thing, you don't need 50. Do those really work as quick as they do in the movies? I think so. Because, yikes. Was when they le- bite down them in the, in the movies, they're like, oh, are you going to kill me? <laughs> <laughs> and then there's like foam right away. I don't know how that stuff works, gotta be honest. Well, I think I mean, that's ab- abundantly clear. Yeah, yeah, we're not gonna do any kind of like trials. So, <laughs> not till the series finale. Yeah. <laughs> the second theory is that it was an accident. On the scene, officers suspected she may have been burned by flames, which she might have fallen into, and responded by jumping backward away from the flames and over the cliff. The police security service, as mentioned before, ultimately decided that the death was an accident. One questionnaire uncovered by this service revealed that she had a large can of hairspray, which in theory could have been dropped in a bonfire she had built. The result would be an explosion, causing her burns and ultimately her death. Though, this doesn't seem to explain the petrol found at the scene that was utilized in her burning. Furthermore, there would also be evidence of an explosion, I'd assume. Uh, I'm, I'm already burning. I'm already burning. <laughs> Let's get this fireworks show going. She takes a petrol shower in, amongst rocks. It doesn't make any fucking sense. No. The third and final theory is that she was murdered. Her possible life of espionage would undeniably lend itself to a veritable list of enemies. So it's not unthinkable that somebody would want her dead. Returning to the crime scene, the jewelry and watch were not found on the body, but beside it, as if it had been placed there. And sure, this could have been the last acts of a person committing suicide. But if her true plan was to commit suicide, why set herself on fire? Adding to this is nobody seemed to have an explanation of how the fire started other than the wild hairspray theory. Returning to the autopsy, there was a strange bruise on the right side of her neck. The crime reporter mentioned before, Newt Havik, also wasn't convinced on the ruling. Quote, personally, I'm totally convinced that this was a murder. She had various identities. She operated with codes. She wore wigs. She traveled from town to town and switched hotels after a few days. This is what the police call conspiratory behavior." End quote. Yeah, she had wigs, she had codes, she had passports. She switched hotels. Uh, she wanted people not to follow her. Yeah, of course she was murdered. Yeah, that just you, makes sense. idiots. <laughs> I know, I, I felt like it was rather clear. Yeah. I mean, the person, if they were murdering her, could, you th- why not just shoot them? I guess then maybe they trace the bullet to your gun. I don't know. Yeah, well, you're not exactly, uh, I would say, the pinnacle of espionage. I could be. I don't think you could be. Uh, look, I'll wear fake mustaches. I'll wear a wig. People won't know it's me. So you're going to wear, a mustache is going to cover up your eight-foot limbs? Is that how it's going to No, there's plenty of tall people in the world. If I wear a mustache and a wig and say, hello, I'm Banjo McClintock, nobody will know. Banjo. <laughs> <laughs> well, they'll think I'm a different person. I don't think so. I think I'd make a better spy. I don't think you would. Yeah, just from a physical requirement. No. Yeah. You'd be shaken. No. <laughs> this is my real name, I promise. <laughs> Why would I be so scared at that Because you're scared of everything. I'm scared of the hotel check-in manager? Yeah, sure you are. I don't think so. Unless it's that situation where, like, normally you're a timid, scared man, but when you step into the shoes of, say, Ricky Goldsworth, yeah. then suddenly you become the most confident man in the That's world. That's the point of a disguise. But can you overcome your the the timidity that is yes yeah hardwired so. to your? I think so. I think that's more likely than you shaving off a couple feet from your limbs. Despite the official ruling being a suicide, many officials involved seemed shaky on that prospect, to say the least. Police lawyer Carl Halvor Os claims that no one in the Bergen Police Department really believed that, claiming the location and nature of the death seemed too odd to be a suicide. A chemist for Kripos, the National Bureau of Crime Investigation in Norway, who attended the autopsy, said, quote, Now as then, I'm in doubt when it comes to what really happened on the site and how the fire developed. It is difficult to be 100% sure. All in all, I support the 1970 report, but 
there is a considerable uncertainty, and it is impossible to rule out that this was either a homicide or an accident." End quote. The police chief, Aspion Brin, ruled the case a suicide, even though just days earlier, he made it clear the case would remain unsolved until the woman's true identity was found. Let me ask you two okay, questions. Two questions. Was she a spy? Yes or no? I would say yes. Was she murdered? Was, she, uh, was it an accident or was it a suicide? I would say she was murdered. Okay, so we could get those two things out of this, I would say. To me, I'd say murdered spy. What about you? I think so too. Okay. Where that takes us, not far. We, don't, we still don't know her name. We still don't know who murdered her, but... Such is the nature of spies. It's a start. It's if a start. She was a damn good spy if uh, we don't even know who killed her. In the end, the Eastall woman was given a Catholic funeral on February 5th, 1971, as the police guessed she may have been Catholic based on what information they had. Tulip's incarnation sat atop her zinc coffin, a coffin that wouldn't decompose, in hopes that one day the coffin could be moved to a more fitting resting place if someone were to claim her. That day has yet to come. As for now, the mystery of the Eastall woman remains unsolved. Sometimes when you're a spy, uh, you, you gotta die. That's like, that comes in the job description. I guess so. Uh, you, you, you don't sign up to be a spy thinking, I'm gonna be here, I'm gonna be tenured. Uh, day one, <laughs> you sit down in spy class, the professor says, look to your left, look to your right. One of these people is gonna set you on fire someday. <laughs> Probably. That's what spies do. This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we investigate the murder of Ken Rex McElroy in the small town of Skidmore, Missouri. This case is odd in that it deals with the question, is a murder justified if it's seemingly warranted? What do you think? No. Why not? I don't trust people to do their homework. I mean, if I'm you gonna... killed everyone you thought was a murderer, you'd have a lot of innocent lives on your hands. On a general basis, I will say I agree with you. But, uh, spoiler alert, not a lot of homework was needed for this fella. Okay, let's get into it. The year is 1981. The town, Skidmore, Missouri. A town surrounded by cornfields with only 437 residents. I've been to Missouri. Lovely state. Can I say that? The Ozarks? Is this you? Uh, yeah, that's a positive statement to start this off. I love Missouri. I saw a mosquito there that was almost the size of a bird. That doesn't seem I've... like something pleasant. Uh, it was almost so big that it couldn't really move around too much. It was not a, a burden. It's a beautiful state. Lot to unpack there. Beautiful uh, state. I think, I think we'll just move forward. On July 10th, 1981, Ken Rex McElroy would be shot dead in the street in broad daylight, amongst as many as 60 witnesses. Yet, to this day, the crime remains unsolved. How could that be possible? Let's start from the beginning. Who was Ken Rex McElroy? Ken Rex McElroy was born June 1st, 1934, to a family of poor tenant farmers who moved near the town of Skidmore, Missouri. By the eighth grade, McElroy had left school, and it's believed he was largely illiterate. At 18, he was said to have been seriously injured when a steel slab fell on him at a construction site. The incident left him with chronic pain, and some have attributed his bizarre and violent behavior to a head injury suffered in this event. They gotta do more research on that, right? On what? Head injuries. Don't they say John Wayne Gacy was, uh, he fell off a swing when he was a boy? So like a CTE kind of thing? Yeah. Is there something, does it, do they lack empathy? Ah, boy. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I'll give that a maybe. It just seems odd for me to blame everything on a head injury. I'm not blaming it all on a head injury, I'm just saying there seems to be a large occurrence of those. I suppose, you might be right in that there, we, there's something to look at there. McElroy was reportedly a 270 pound giant of a man. A local farmer described McElroy saying, quote, I think that Ken simply wanted to be big and important and have people afraid of him when he walked down the street. And he got that, they were. End quote. 270 pounds, that's a beefy man. That's a beefy guy. I would not cross him under, under any circumstance. You're not uh, thrown down uh, in the street? I, uh, how, do I, how do I say I'm a wimp? In spite of all this, McElroy made a relatively substantial living off of leasing land near his farm, trading and racing dogs, as well as allegedly stealing livestock, grain, 
alcohol, gasoline, and antiques. McElroy was in constant trouble with the law. His lawyer estimated that he was charged with various crimes at least three times a year, and by some counts, he was indicted as many as 21 times, but escaped conviction all but once. McElroy was often known to brag that his Kansas City lawyer, Richard Gene McFadden, also represented the mob and would effectively keep him out of jail. So he's walking around town saying, I could do whatever I want. I got a big fancy pants lawyer from out of town and he's gonna make sure all you small folk can't touch me. I wonder if part of it is because it seems like all of the things he did were relatively small time, right? At this point. Oh, I mean, that 21 is including the some of the bigger ones. That we're going to get into. That we're going to get into. Well, at least the list that you've named so far, it was like a lot of, oh, I stole some oh, gasoline. Oh, that's, that's just an appetizer. I just fed you a cracker. I'm about to come with the full platter now. Oh, boy. And it's, it's not a good platter. Oh, it's so a good cracker. Enjoy it, because it's about to turn into a shit sandwich real quick. Another tactic to avoid jail that McElroy would employ is intimidating witnesses. To do this, he'd follow them or park outside their homes and watch watched them until they were no longer willing to testify against him. His various alleged crimes include robbery, harassing slash assaulting women, destroying property, threatening lives, and assault, including shooting at least two people. One of those two people he shot was local farmer Romaine Henry, who McElroy shot in the stomach when Henry tried to chase McElroy off Henry's land. In the stomach of all places? On his own land. On his own land. He was probably enjoying a nice glass of sweet tea. Yeah. And then this fucking knucklehead comes on his property and he gets shot in the stomach. In the stomach, that's the worst place to get shot. I'm, I'm sure any place is a pretty bad place to get shot, but oh yeah, shoulder, I guess. Shoulder meat. Like Before we get into McElroy's relationships, I'd like to issue a fair warning that what follows is upsetting and depicts extreme violence towards women, but is important for me to tell you in order to paint the full picture. McElroy was accused of raping two young women as young as 12 years old, both of which he was said to have married to keep them from testifying against him. One of these women was 24-year-old Trina McLeod, who was his partner and was also present at the time of McElroy's death. Trina was McElroy's third wife, though all unions were suspect due to the fact that some of his marriages overlapped as well as the fact that McElroy was known to prefer girls around the age of 13 or 14. Fuck this guy. That train arrived at the station rather quickly for me as well. In fact, McElroy actually entered a relationship with Trina when she was only 14 years old, having a child with her around that same time. Soon after having their first child, Trina attempted to escape to her parents' house. McElroy responded, by allegedly burning down Trina's parents' home and shooting their dog. First so, off, holy shit, is I guess like the first reaction to that. Second off, it does amaze me that at this point, I know I get he's intimidating, he's a big force. It's a small town, maybe he could use that to manipulate his way around the law. But at this point, I do think law and order should come into play here, right? Yes. Yet, in 1981, Trina told People Magazine that the house fire was, quote, just faulty wiring. End quote. To make matters worse, McElroy was also accused of abusing his first two wives, Sharon and Alice, as is often the case in stories of domestic abuse. In later interviews with both Alice and Trina, they seemed to minimize their abuse and even claimed McElroy treated them well. In 1981, shortly after his death, Alice told People Magazine that, quote, Ken was totally different from the way they are saying he was now. Oh, he was wild, but he wasn't guilty of all those things they say. He was honest and generous. I never knew him to steal anything ever, end quote. That's common though, That's right? common. It's common and it's sad. It makes it even grosser because this guy was maybe, dare I say, charming in some aspects. Obviously it sounds like he's an evil, evil man, but people aren't always shades of black and white. It's not this person's a good person, this person's yeah, an evil yeah, person. So as much as he was committing these heinous, heinous things, there were probably parts of him where people were like, well, he's not that bad of a guy. Look, I'm all for seeing the good in people and finding redeemable qualities. <laughs> yeah. For the record, I'm not saying, well, let's, let's, <laughs> let's look for the good qualities. I, I, I get what you're saying. I just wanted to make it absolutely abundantly clear that I, we're, uh, we're for redeeming qualities and maybe seeing the good in people, but in some cases, throw it out. Absolutely. Trina said in that same interview, Quote, the officers were always hassling him. 
They'd accuse him of anything, even things I know he didn't do because I was with him. They just hated him because he wouldn't kneel down to them." End quote. So the guy seems morally bankrupt to begin with. Mm -hmm. yes. He's got these uh, horrible relationships with these minors, yes. their children. So that gives you an idea of his character. Mm -hmm. It's more than likely that he just told them, oh, I didn't do that. And his wife's probably believed them. And that's the sad thing. They're part, already yeah. in his camp. In all these instances, is he just getting away with it? Is he going to court for these things? He was getting, uh, the cops were apprehending he was going to court. Uh -huh. It's just that his lawyer was actually that good wow. that he would get him out. He would get him off every time. So he probably was uh, maybe a, a mob lawyer that was good enough to maneuver around the law through loopholes and whatnot. I'm picturing like an Al Pacino type. I, I don't know. He's got to be good. However, it's known that even the county's law enforcement officials were afraid of encountering McElroy, who was known to always be heavily armed and unafraid of shooting cops. For over two decades, the people of Skidmore often felt abandoned by the justice system that couldn't stop McElroy from further terrorizing them. Little did they know, an incident would occur that would change everything. On April 25th, 1980, in Ernest Bo Bowenkamp's general store, the store clerk, Evelyn Sumi, would ask McElroy's eight-year-old daughter, Tanya, to return a piece of candy she had not paid for. When he learned of the incident, McElroy was so incensed, he reportedly began stalking the Bowenkamp family. This led to the events of July 8th, 1980 when McElroy would drive into the alley behind the Bowenkamp General Store. Once there, he threatened Bo Bowenkamp and shot the grocer in the neck at close range with a shotgun, marking at least the second reported time McElroy had shot somebody. Yeah. I assume that person died. Uh, actually. He got shot point blank? With a shotgun. With a shotgun and he Lived? I wouldn't consider myself an overly religious man, <laughs> but I could maybe buy into the concept of a, a little divine inf intervention. Luckily, Bo Bowenkamp survived, and McElroy was arrested and charged with attempted murder. His preliminary trial was set for August 18th, 1980. In typical fashion, McElroy made attempts to intimidate the Bowenkamp family and supporters to keep them from testifying. Bowenkamp's wife recalled, quote, you can't know how intimidating it was after that. Before his trial, he'd drive up to our house in his pickup at night and just sit there. Sometimes he would fire his gun. It was frightening, end quote. That is some over the top super villain bullshit. That's fucking insane. I don't like this man. Through legal maneuvers, McElroy was able to delay the trial almost five months until June 25th, 1981. During this time, the acting prosecuting attorney resigned and a young new prosecutor named David Baird was hired to fill his position. Some have speculated that McElroy had bullied the previous prosecutor to leave. The new prosecutor, David Baird, was only three years out of law school, yet Baird accomplished what no other lawyer had been able to do in all of McElroy's criminal history. He convicted him of a crime. Granted, McElroy was ultimately only convicted at his trial of second degree assault. The jury set a maximum sentence of two years, and the judge freed him on a $40,000 bail bond pending the appeal. This was partly because Baird lessened McElroy's charge from quote, attempt to kill, end quote, to quote, knowingly caused serious physical injury, end quote, to ensure that he could secure a conviction. You try to kill someone and there's eight different labels for it. And he chose a label that would make the conviction a sure thing. That's nutty. That's Just bad. put him in jail. This lawyer that they're going up against must be very good for him to, the guy shot a guy in the fucking sh neck with a shotgun. I know, Ryan. And he felt so strongly about this other dude's skills that he changed the labeling of that just so he could secure conviction for only two years and yeah. he got out. This is a, a case of seeing it go through the justice system and, and getting dunked on. Yeah. Uh, just completely failing. It seemed like a victory almost and then nothing. McElroy reportedly said of the trial, quote, the jury convicted me and they gave me two years, but I'll tell you what, I'll never go to jail. I'll appeal and get off. I've been fighting the law since I was 13, and I'm damn near 50. I've been arrested for over 53 felonies, 
and this is the first one I ever lost, end quote. Unbelievable. I, the, this, the showboating The here. braggadocio of this man right here is, is staggering. This is the problem with the man who, uh, I guess, believes in his own myth. Yeah. And is cap- especially when that man is capable of cruelty. He's Icarus, baby. He is Icarus. Yeah. And guess what? This bad boy is about to fly towards the sun. Soon after he was released, McElroy, bizarrely, was spotted with a rifle and bayonet at the town's local bar, D&G Tavern, where he was allegedly making graphic threats about murdering Bo Bowenkamp. So he follows it up. So, right th- then. so this isn't Icarus flying too close to the sun. He's flying into the sun. Yeah, this is Icarus turning 90 degrees, looking at the sun, and playing chicken with it. <laughs> Exactly. As a result, he was arrested and quickly released, with the only consequence being the postponement of his court hearing to July 20th, 1981, for violating his bail provisions for being armed. In the wake of these events, on the morning of July 10th, 1981, there was a meeting at the town's Legion Hall just down the street from the D&G Tavern. As many as 60 Skidmore residents attended, including both the mayor and the sheriff. The meeting's entire purpose was to discuss what they could legally do to prevent McElroy from harming anyone else. County Sheriff Dan Estes suggested the formation of a neighborhood watch. You realize how how deep of dire straits this town really is when the sheriff is saying, maybe we should form a neighborhood watch. That's like someone just raising their hand and saying, what if we write a note? But the collective mindset of those in attendance seemingly could be summed up by one quote from an attendee. Quote, we simply felt that the system had failed us. We all knew what McElroy was like, and there he was again and again. It seemed like nobody could stop him, end quote. Those at the meeting heard reports that McElroy and Trina were spotted heading to the D&G Tavern in Skidmore to grab drinks. It is said that the meeting adjourned and that the crowd of about 60 people then quietly descended upon the D&G Tavern, flanking McElroy's truck. Some even went into the bar, where they waited for him to finish his drinks. Upon their return to the truck, where Trina was sitting in the passenger seat, McElroy lit a cigarette. Trina claimed to have turned over her shoulder and seen someone pull a rifle from the back of the truck and take aim at McElroy. And then, shots were fired, shattering the truck's windows. Trina reportedly dove from her side of the vehicle onto the street and was picked up by a man named Jack Clement and walked toward the bank for safety. You could start a fe- sort of feel the dread building yeah. when the meeting adjourned and you know it's going down right it's now. Going down. They've had enough. They've yeah. been pushed to their limit. It's time to take some action. I'm not afraid to admit I, I felt some joy. McElroy, at the age of 47, remained in the car, shot dead, getting hit twice. The shot came from roughly behind him, so he would not have seen his shooter. Bullet casings from two different guns were found. Notably, none of the witnesses called an ambulance. Do you think there was one guy who was like, I'll call, oh. He just got a firm <laughs> stare, everyone just <laughs> turns their heads toward him. While there were as many as 60 witnesses reported at the scene, no one but Trina would come forward in the investigation that followed to say who had fired the shots. Cheryl Houston, the daughter of Bo Bowenkamp, witnessed the shooting from her family's store and said this on the silence that followed the murder. Quote, once the shroud of silence fell, there was going to be no one talking. They could have pushed and dug, pushed and dug, and gotten nothing. We were so bitter and so angry at the law letting us down that it came to somebody taking matters in their own hand. No one has any idea what a nightmare we lived, end quote. I would would kill to know what his dying thoughts were. Just to know that it was this guy who was so sure of himself, so, so sure that he had the world in the palm of his hand, that he could get away with anything, and suddenly the world, seemingly collectively, turns in on him and says, no, we're going to shoot you yeah. in the street like a dog. And now you know what? I hate to say it, but I think he, he may have known it was coming, and he was one of those types that was like, whatever, I allow this to happen. That makes me angry. Right? In the murder investigation that followed, there was only one suspect, a shooter that Trina identified as Del Clement, who was a part owner of the D&G Tavern. However, Clement denied the charge and there were no other witnesses to come forward. And ultimately, 
The DA and the coroner's jury did not order an arrest warrant or press charges. Harry N. McLean, author of a book on the case titled In Broad Daylight, spent some time with Clement during his years researching his book and describes Clement as a quote, short man with a chip on his shoulder and a hot temper, wore a cowboy hat and drank heavily, end quote. In regards to the shooting, McLean describes Clement saying, quote, it wasn't hard to imagine him jerking the gun from his pickup in a burst of anger and opening up on the large black head on the other side of the rear window of the pickup, end quote. McLean also says that in the years he spent researching, he never heard another name seriously mentioned as the shooter besides Del Clement. In 2009, Clement passed away, and up until his death, he continued to deny any role in the killing. I don't think anyone was after glory in this incident. No. You know, I don't think anyone needed to say, the people who were directly affected by it, they seemingly were all gathered around. They know what happened, they know who shot him, so you don't have to shout to the world, hey, no. it was me, because you walk into that general store, they give you the nod, you give them the nod. It brings the town together. Yeah. It's uh, in a weird way, uh, this horrible event has brought the town together in a, a very poetic and beautiful moment. I can imagine and the town was a lot happier after this. That being said, author Harry N. McLean has also noted, quote, I personally believe it's a mistake to put too much emphasis on who pulled the trigger, end quote. Which brings us back to the town hall meeting that preceded the shooting. It's easy to wonder if the murder was a plot that formed there. Though, McLean has posed that he doesn't believe the killing was a planned vigilante action. Rather, he believes that a few people made an impulsive decision to take action, but the small town stood by them in solidarity with their complicit silence. I love it. Let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Some people have maybe questioned, was this meeting a place where they were like, okay, we're gonna go out there, you two are gonna shoot him, and we're not gonna say anything. I'm not saying that is what happened, but if it is in fact how it happened, is that fine? Does, this, does that make this worse? I don't think it makes it worse. I do think it was probably spontaneous though. I agree. I think maybe um, the meeting went poorly. People <laughs> saw that nothing was gonna happen. The sheriff was mentioning a neighborhood watch as a solution. But I think that maybe fed the idea. If they were talking about, well, we need to keep a keep a, an eye on this guy, we all need to band together, then they get news that he's heading to the tavern, so they're probably like, great, let's just go intimidate him. Maybe all of them, you know, a, a, a group of them decided to go do that, which would lead to one of them just... Yeah, I mean, I think it was a meeting where obviously everyone was airing out their disdain for this man. And if they you collectively understand that everyone in this town feels the same way, for the first, like, I don't know. For the first, maybe. everyone, maybe, yeah, maybe this is the first time they're all airing out their grievances. They realize there's nothing they could do to stop this man. They know everyone feels this way. Yeah. And then you hear, he's outside by the tavern. Green light. Everyone goes, let's just go out there and look. Mm -hmm. And two people. They know. They're like, no, it's ending right now. They know everybody's got their back. Once the local major cases squad investigated, the FBI also investigated. Ultimately, three grand juries heard evidence, but no one was ever indicted for the murder. Trina filed a $6 million wrongful death lawsuit against the town of Skidmore, Nottoway County, the Sheriff Danny Estes, Skidmore's Mayor Steve Peters, and Del Clement on July 9th, 1984. However, the case ultimately settled for $17,600. Trina ended up leaving town and remarrying, and passed away in 2012 on her 55th birthday. As recently as 2006, then Nottoway County Sheriff Ben Espy said of the McElroy case, quote, they all seem to know who did it, but they don't want to get involved. I'll do everything in my power to arrest the person, end quote. Though, it's noted that he is said to have said this in a tone, quote, conveying no particular optimism. Vigilante justice is a slippery slope. It is. It's an ethical dilemma. You don't want a whole town getting carried away. Maybe that guy doesn't cut his lawn often enough. You don't want a whole town murdering him. But in this case, I think it's abundantly clear I that do. some action was needed. Action was needed to be taken. Whatever that action ended up being, uh, we were just gonna have to live with because they'd gone through years and decades, literally, of oppression from this man. Mm -hmm. I think it would be unfortunate to take away from what this town did together 
and the fact that they took a stand against something that was truly evil. I don't think we've ever really delved into moral dilemmas quite like this. We did metaphorically draw the line in the sand. Where you stand on it uh, is, is up to you. After McElroy's death, the town as a whole saw a significant decrease in the amount of cattle and pig thefts in the county. Even just in the subsequent month, the case garnered national media attention from outlets such as Rolling Stone and 60 Minutes. Headlines often emphasize the vigilante nature of the killing. What remains concrete are the facts. A man was killed on account of his actions and will likely never officially know the shooter. How you feel about it can be debated both internally and externally, but regardless, the case of Ken Rex McElroy will officially remain unsolved. This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we investigate the murder of William Desmond Taylor, a notable film director in 1920s Hollywood. Let's peek behind the curtain and see a little bit behind the glitz and the glamour. Well, but you know what they say, it's not all glitz and glamour. Wait, you just said that, right? Yeah. You know, uh, I don't know how else to restate it. Sometimes people get murdered in Hollywood. <laughs> Let's get into it. Hollywood, February 2nd. 1922, the crime, murder, and what would become one of the biggest scandals to rock early Hollywood. The victim, film director William Desmond Taylor, known by his friends as Bill, born in Carlow, Ireland on April 26th, 1872. Directing more than 40 films for what is now known as Paramount and working with Tinseltown's brightest stars, Taylor was well-liked, respected, and seen as a leading filmmaker. Taylor himself even starred in one of the first feature films that would define Hollywood and would later serve as president of the Motion Picture Directors Association for several years. By all accounts, William Desmond Taylor was a glimmering beacon in the cinema firmament. 40 movies in 1920 equates to two weeks of work. Yeah, because they, they <laughs> This movie's called Man Drops Potato. <laughs> yeah, and there, and there was like shooting like 10 movies at the same time in the same room. Uh -huh. No sound. He's got six uh, cigars in yeah. his mouth. He's operating seven different cameras. He also acted in one, um, and that became a Hollywood classic. Was he a good actor? Uh, he only acted in one, so. so I'm gonna, nope. Yeah. He was a big deal back then, all right? Okay. Well, Leave WDT alone. Okay. Jesus. Oh, look, I'm not calling into question his talent. Yeah. Or his reputation. This is coming from the, the auteur of Dogs Watch Television for the first time. Oh, that's a good video. Picture, if you will, the scene of the crime. Nestled on the corner of Alvarado and Maryland in the posh LA neighborhood of Westlake Park sits the luxurious apartment of William Desmond Taylor. The time? 7.30 a.m., February 2nd. Taylor's valet, Henry Peavy, arrives at his usual time to make breakfast for Taylor. Upon opening the door, Peavy spots the obscured feet of his boss on the ground. He calls out to Taylor. No response. Creeping in a bit farther, Peavy discovers to his horror the body of William Desmond Taylor, fully dressed lying face up with blood around his mouth. No sign of a struggle is immediately apparent. It's assumed he died of natural causes. PV's shouts alert the neighbors, many of them Hollywood stars and starlets themselves, who gradually shuffle into Taylor's apartment. Who's there, like Greta Garbo and Charlie Chaplin? Well, Let's he, get a load of this bloody man. Well, the thing is he lived in an apartment complex that was very luxurious and there was a lot of people who were already in Hollywood living next door. Wow, that's fun. It was a, a wild scene. Also, the <laughs> last thing- <laughs> It was a wild scene. It is. The last thing you want when there's a crime scene that's fresh is everybody shuffling in in their fucking night Walking robes. in with cosmopolitan. Yeah, exactly. Whoa. Oh, wonder what's going on here. Ugh, gross blood. You know, I got on my shoe, let me rub it off on this carpet. That kind of thing. Yeah. You know, you don't want that in a crime scene. 8 a.m., the police arrive on the scene. 8.40 a.m., Coroner William McDonald arrives to move and examine the body, and it becomes quite obvious this death 
was not due to natural causes. They lift Taylor's body to reveal a pool of blood staining the carpet where Taylor lay. A 38 caliber bullet had entered the left side of his back. Based on the placement of the bullet holes in Taylor's jacket and vest, Officials conclude that his arms were raised at the time he was shot. Bizarrely, the police would later consider this could mean Taylor was embracing somebody, who then shot him in the back. Meaning they shot him while they were hugging him. Then, boom. I, wouldn't you? Or, or just from the, like. No, but he got shot in the back and went through the back. In the back, that seems awkward, right? Also. Wouldn't you shoot yourself? Wouldn't you shoot yourself? I don't know. Bullets, do they stay in a body or do they just go? No, yeah, they a, stay in a body, right? There's, well, there's exit wounds sometimes. And this one had an exit wound. So it would it would have sh shot that person. Shot the person. Unless they planned it so that they were like kind of like an Olay situation where he's like, da, and they move like that. Oh, like. Pew. Yeah, they like running with the bullets. Like yeah. Except it's a bullet. Police also supposedly find a silky garment, pinkish in color, that, quote, resembled a nightgown, end quote. Detective Sergeant Edward King later tells reporters he thinks it belonged to a woman. A robbery is ruled out, as Taylor's wallet was left behind with $78 cash inside, as well as other valuable items in the home. Shortly after the discovery of the bullet wound, the Alvarado Court apartments are filled with reporters and photographers from every LA newspaper, as well as several papers outside of LA. Amidst the chaos of the crime scene, one detail worth mentioning is the fact that before the police and reporters arrived, Paramount studio manager Charles Aiden visited the crime scene upon hearing the news. It's believed that Aiden removed evidence from Taylor's apartment that morning in an attempt to avoid or at least minimize the scandal. Some even believe he may have planted false evidence such as pink lingerie, perhaps to hide the fact that, as one theory had it, Taylor was a homosexual. Detective Sergeant Edward King, who was assigned to the Taylor case, is among those who believed Paramount was taking measures to keep silent their stars, who may have had useful information on the chance that it would implicate them. When considering the roster of stars associated with the case, the motive for the studio interfering was quite strong. Though, this only leads to more questions. What was Aiden cleaning up? And whom was he covering for? So studio heads back then, sort of playing God. Yeah, uh, sort of, yeah, like a little bit of a God complex. Anytime uh, a major studio uh, and a person in a position of power starts tampering with, uh, with any kind of case like this, things aren't what they seem, obviously. All bets are off. Got those dirty, dirty Hollywood fingers all over it. This is like a classic dirty Hollywood yeah. story. It stinks, man. It stinks, yeah. All the way up to the top. It's making my mouth dry. Let me... That's better. <laughs> mm, puppy. Let's take a look at the night before the body is discovered. The night that Taylor was shot. 7.45 p.m. Hollywood comedy star Mabel Normand, the last person known to have seen Taylor alive, leaves Taylor's home and is driven off by her chauffeur, William Davis. 8 p.m. A sound that could have been a gunshot is heard by actor and neighbor Douglas McLean and his wife Faith. This possible gunshot is also heard by apartment manager E.C. Jesserin, who writes it off as a misidentification when no other disturbance follows. At first I thought that's a bit suspicious, but then the more I thought about it, I, 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 was, I was thinking... You write it off. Last night I was in my apartment and in the hallway I heard what at first I thought was a woman yeah. Like, maybe in pain or in distress. Mm -hmm. At first it was, ah! And I was like, oh no, there's someone in my building in trouble? Yeah. And then I just put my ear by the door and it changed to, ah! 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 It could have been someone in distress, but my brain immediately was like, mm, I think someone's having sex in the elevator. I <laughs> and then the elevator door closes and I stopped hearing anything, so... 
it's a bit much to confront the fact that hey, maybe someone's being murdered right now. It's so a you lot. take the you're, you're, you maybe not consciously you you take the easy way out, much like you take the easy way out when you're confronted with ghost evidence. Oh, wind. Ryan, not the season for shoes, it. Uh, not the season. Shoes pivoting. I nope. just thought I'd make that point. Let's not discuss that this season. After hearing this sound, Faith McLean spots a man outside Taylor's home. She does not get a good look at the man's face, but sees that he is clean shaven, white, of medium build, around five foot nine, and dressed in dark clothing and a cap. She would later say, quote, he was dressed like my idea of a motion picture burglar, end quote. Sounds like a hunk. <laughs> it, right? Well, it sounds like someone went to Party City and was like, make me look like a criminal. You have a cape? No, he didn't have a cape, he wasn't Zorro. The man seems to notice Faith watching him, but does not appear to be alarmed or in any hurry. Faith sees the man look back into Taylor's home for a moment, as if saying goodbye. Then, the man leaves, closing Taylor's door behind him. At the time, Faith does not think much of it. I don't know how she didn't think much of that. You say he's dressed like a cat burglar, uh, he's poking around this guy's house, you heard something that sounded like a gunshot. I think all those things together may make me think a little bit about it. What if he was just turning around though and he like it looked like he was saying goodbye but what if he just sort of did a double take like that's a wrap. 8:15 p.m. Howard Fellows, Taylor's chauffeur at the time of his death, moves Taylor's car into the garage. When he goes to drop off the keys at Taylor's apartment, Taylor does not answer his door despite the lights being on inside. It's assumed by police that Taylor was already dead at this time. The next day, police would find six cigarette butts in the alley behind Taylor's and the McLean's apartments. The McLean's maid, Christina Jewett, heard footsteps in this alley around the time of the supposed gunshot. Perhaps the killer bided his time until he saw an opportunity to strike. Why is this unsolved? Well, I mean, seems we like a Seems like they're really zeroing in here. Well, we don't know who the man is. Oh. And most importantly, we don't know if the man was acting independently. Mmm. Looks like you're jumping to conclusions. Yeah, I am. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that detective mind of yours is, is, isn't as strong as you thought. No, no, no. It's, uh, it's pretty it's not as strong. Pretty strong. I have a strong brain. Also of note was the testimony of two men who claimed an unknown man inquired where Taylor lived around 6 p.m. on the night of the murder at a nearby gas station. The man's description was similar to Faith McLean's, although this man was wearing a dark suit. Yeah, he's at a gas station? He's at a gas station Maybe near. buying more smokes? Well, there it is. See, there, there, he's back. <laughs> he's back. <laughs> Yeah, he was, he was talking about, he was asking where Taylor lived. He was at a gas station near where Taylor lived already. Uh, Wait, he was asking where Taylor? He was asking these two men at the gas station at 6 p.m., two hours before the gunshot, where yeah. Taylor lived. Oh, I missed that part entirely. I guess the detective mind is actually not there at all. Huh, interesting. Exiting the events of that night, let's examine odd events that perhaps foreshadowed Taylor's demise. Towards the end of 1921, Taylor had received several mysterious and unnerving phone calls, seemingly with nobody on the other end of the line when he answered. Additionally, Taylor's home was robbed on December 4th, 1921. The thief had taken jewelry and the special imported cigarettes Taylor smoked, which had gold tips. On December 27th, he received a strange package. And for more details on that, let's get in to our first suspect. The first suspect is Edward F. Sands, who had previously served as Taylor's secretary slash valet slash cook. In 1921, Sands had forged checks from Taylor for more than $5,000, also taking jewelry and clothing before eventually disappearing. Sands had previously been court-martialed for embezzlement and dishonorably discharged from the U.S. Navy. According to actress Claire Windsor, Taylor had voiced his intention to kill Sands if he ever saw him again. $5,000 back then, it's actually quite a bit of cash. Yeah. So, oh, so Taylor was going to kill him? 
Yeah, because he had stolen so much from him. That's so strange. Do you think he meant it? I'm sure. I mean, it could have been like, I'm going to kill him next time I see him, and then you see him, and you're like, hey! I, uh, yeah, right. I, yeah. I can't imagine he'd see him at, like, the Copacabana, and he'd just... Just pull out a gun and yeah. shoot him. Yeah. No, I think it was he was angry with him is what we'll get from that. Huh. Uh, this is just demonstrating that there is bad blood between the two of them. Yes. This conversation was several days before Taylor himself was murdered. Further demonstrating a grudge, Sands had spent time digging up dirt on Taylor's private life before finally absconding with his money. This snooping brings us to one of the weirdest twists in the case. The revelation that Taylor wasn't who he said he was, and Sands perhaps knew it. As mentioned before, Taylor had received a strange package on December 27th. The package was postmarked from Stockton, California, and contained a pawn slip for the jewelry that was stolen on December 4th. The pawn slips had been signed William Deanne Tanner, which, as Taylor's murder investigation would reveal, was Taylor's real name. Along with the pawn slip was a note that read, quote, so sorry to inconvenience you, even temporarily. Also, observe the lesson of the forced sale of assets, a Merry Christmas, and a happy and prosperous New Year, end quote. Also notable was the name used to sign the note, quote, alias Jimmy V, end quote. This could possibly be a reference to the film Alias Jimmy Valentine, a movie about a thief who frequently eludes the cops. More importantly, this note suggests the thief, possibly Sands, stole the jewelry and then pawned it off using Taylor's real name to taunt him. As Sands likely knew, there was a reason Taylor had changed his name. Before making the change, Taylor had started and deserted a family, a past he had hidden to preserve his reputation. Perhaps knowing this, Sand sent this note and jewelry pawn slips to mock Taylor. It's worth mentioning, the handwriting on this note was similar to Sand's. Police attempted to lure Sands to Los Angeles via a woman he dated, a ploy that did not work, and police were never able to question their major suspect. So he, I mean, it very well likely could be him. They just never were able to catch him. He's a greasy one. They just couldn't find him. I mean, it's, I don't know, it's the 1920s. It must be harder to find people. Yeah, I guess you just go find a tree to sit under somewhere. <laughs> Yellow pages? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think you're pretty fucked once he gets past the state border. Just move to a new town, tell him, you, uh, hi there, my name's uh, Ricky Goldsworth. Ricky Goldsworth. You know, if you ever get tired of doing this, you can just move to a new town, tell him your name is Ricky Goldsworth, and yeah. you're done. You're set for life. Yeah, I'd tell them that. I want the top house. I want the top room. You can't just move into a town. No, and, no, no. Yeah, no, yeah. so you yeah, can't yeah, just yeah, move yeah. into a town and take a house. I don't think you heard me. What? I want the best house in your neighborhood, and I want it stocked with food, Sir, furnished, you, and I want servants as well. I want butlers, and you're going to be one sir, of them. Sir, you can't. You're I'm gonna not going to be, gonna be a I'm the mayor, sir. No, that's not how this is going down. Oh, shit. Your outfit's in my car. I'll expect you at my house later, 8 a.m. Leave the keys under the mat. Yes, sir, Mr. Goldsworth. <sighs> Good Goldsworth. What a story. Gold, Goldsworth It's really coming into his own. You talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> the second suspect is Mabel Normand, the queen of comedy. Mabel was the last known person to see Taylor alive, and it had been long rumored that Mabel and Taylor were intimate, a fact that Mabel denied. Though, it's easy to see why this was believed. One of the valuables found in Taylor's pocket was a silver locket containing a photo of Mabel Normand, engraved with, quote, to my dearest, end quote. Mabel also admitted that she and Taylor had exchanged letters, which the press dubbed the, quote, blessed baby letters, end quote, named after Taylor's pet name for Mabel, which she used when signing her letters to him. However, the letters were not found at Taylor's apartment. Some believe these letters could have been among the evidence removed from Taylor's apartment by studio manager Charles Aiden. I, I think it's pretty certain that they were in his house and they were removed, which doesn't look good. The studio head removed these love letters between Mabel and... Yeah, so she would sign her letters, blessed baby, 
Blessed baby. Weird because, thing to which is, Well, that was his pet name for her, which is... Oh, blessed baby. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. Yeah, it's, it's gross. Why does the studio head care... That's the question you should be asking. Why should he care that Mabel Norman is placed inside his apartment several times with these letters, possibly? Mm. Why, is, why does he care about their relationship being public? Mabel said she wouldn't have minded if people read them, but thought that they might be, quote, misunderstood, end quote. Aiden would eventually turn over some of Taylor's personal papers to the police, but it's possible that he still retained papers the studio didn't want them to see. Well, also, what the shit? Why, why don't they just get a, like, a search warrant and go to this dude's house and be like, hey man, give us everything. He owns the law, man. Oh, you're, you're the, you think that like the studio owns the police, like yeah. they're in the pocket? Yeah, of course they are. I mean, that's not for sure, is you it? You ever seen LA Confidential? LA cops back in the day were in the pocket of the powerful men in the city. That's a fictional film. Yeah, I know. On February 9, the blessed baby letters were turned over to the chief deputy DA, W.C. Doran. After causing such a fuss, what did these letters say, you might ask? Of what I could find, and also of what was actually handed over, one read, quote, sorry I cannot dine with you tomorrow because I have a previous engagement with a Hindu prince. Some other time, blessed baby. End quote. Not exactly a criminal manifesto. No. <laughs> hey, we've all been to dinner with a Hindu prince. Yeah, yeah, right? That's just something you do. Uh, what a life she's leading. So this could either be, A, these letters were in fact very suspicious mm -hmm. and not all of them were handed over, or B, she was kind of worried that this may make it seem like they're in a relationship, overreacted, and by her overreacting and saying these may be misunderstood, it actually made her look more... Uh, guilty. Yes. At the behest of District Attorney Thomas Lee Woolwine, Detective Sergeant King had Mabel's home searched in response to a tip that the murder weapon would be found in her house. During that search, two guns were uncovered, but both were 25 caliber and did not match the murder weapon. One theory holds that while Mabel didn't murder Taylor herself, Mabel's addiction to drugs, her association with drug dealers, and Taylor's known insistence in helping Mabel get off drugs possibly led to someone from Mabel's world doing the job. She's on drugs? Yeah, Mabel. She had trouble with alcohol and drugs. To be fair, most of Hollywood had trouble with drugs back then. In it was fact, just like amphetamines or something? Uh, it was an old-timey drug? I'm not sure what the drugs were, but I know that most of Hollywood at the time was under the influence of drugs, and Taylor was a crusader in terms of that. He, he was against it. He was trying to clean Hollywood up. Pretty boring for him to be that way. Well, uh, I, I mean, I maybe boring enough. Maybe all someone, of Hollywood ganged up on him. I mean, that's kind of what This I'm guy's getting. a real buzzkill. Captain Edward A. Salisbury, an explorer and colleague of Taylor's, was quoted saying, quote, Billy Taylor threatened to make an example of the drug peddlers in Hollywood, but they evidently got him first." End quote. The third suspect is Mary Miles Minter, a 19-year-old silent film star who was vocal about her most likely unreciprocated love for Taylor, who had directed her in the past. A few love letters written by Mary to Taylor were found amongst Taylor's possessions, one of which read, quote, Dearest, I love you, I love you, I love you, X, 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 yours always, Mary, end quote. Not exactly a poet. Very insistent. Yeah, that's a lot. You know, incriminating, perhaps not embarrassing, definitely. Yeah, I wouldn't want that. I'd kill someone if if they were like, I'm gonna make this letter public. Other letters were bizarrely written in code though, when decoded, contain nothing but the written affections of a young girl. I know that may seem weird, it is weird. What kind of code? Like a cipher, and when decoded, it was pretty much her uh, telling him she wanted to take long drives with him, sit by the fire and snog. Boy, I can't imagine why this guy uh, didn't want anything to do with her. <laughs> Another item turned over to police on February 9 was a lace and silk handkerchief embroidered with Mary's initials of MMM. Rumors began that the pink nightgown found in the apartment also had the initials MMM. Both of these items could possibly place Mary in his apartment at least at some point. 
So, well, so he, where was the handkerchief? It was in his apartment. In his apartment. And so was apparently this nightgown. If there, in fact, is a pink nightgown in there with her initials on it, I mean, that looks like maybe they may have been intimate. At the very least, it places her inside his apartment. Which yes. Is all the investigators are trying to do. Which, to me, again, is not that suspect. I suppose. You know, I've had people in my apartment who uh, didn't murder me. I, I don't find it that suspicious that the handkerchief was in the apartment, because, I don't know, she seems to have been after him. Maybe, maybe I Maybe she was over there for a cup of tea at some you, point. Or maybe she could have mailed it to him. Yeah. Which is... It's like, here's my scent. <laughs> I'm a weirdo, remember? <laughs> Smell it before you go to sleep at night and think of it. Think of the drives we might take. I love you, I love you, I love you. You decoded the letter, right? <laughs> yeah, I'll get to that. Though, interestingly, Mary claimed that she and Taylor had never been intimate. Mary also stated that she did not believe that any of the men she had rebuffed would be jealous enough to kill Taylor. After hearing that Taylor had been shot, Mary showed up at his apartment in dramatic fashion as reporters took note. I love it. Uh, her showing up in dramatic fashion though, that's just her, you know, going to the hot party of the... Uh, oh yeah, yeah. If, if all, like you say, all the big stars are there, it's like, oh, oh, and here she comes sleeping Wait, it, in a fresh it, puddle of blood. You think they were taking selfies with the body or something? Well. Maybe, I don't know. Or it seemed sketchies. like it was, it was the hot ticket. Well, I, I looked at that more with a more incriminating lens. I thought it was her putting on a show to show that she was remorseful. So no. that in the case of a murder investigation, everyone would, take, would have taken note how heartbroken she was. Aside from a possible motive of killing Taylor due to being rejected, there isn't much to implicate Mary. It's more likely her relationship with Taylor boiled down as a way to escape from her overbearing stage mother, Charlotte Shelby, who by the way, is our fourth and final suspect. Charlotte Shelby, mother of Mary Miles Minter, pushed her daughter into acting at a young age. Mary was actually originally named Juliet, and Shelby even went as far as having Mary steal the identity of a dead cousin named Mary Minter to make Juliet older on paper so that Mary slash Juliet could continue working. From then on, Juliet went by Mary Miles Minter. Classic stage mom. That is fucking insane. I mean, we've talked about stage moms before. I think it's a little strange to take your little child, dress them up like a little pony, put them out on a stage. Oh, dance for the people, dance. Dance. You're three years old. Dance for them and make sure you refer to yourself by the name of your dead cousin. It's very strange. It's one thing to have a stage name, right? Yeah. It's another thing to steal the identity of a dead family member. Yeah. So that you could go, uh, re recite Hamlet. Yes. It, it's uh, fucking strange. I don't think she was reciting Hamlet. You get what I'm saying, you <laughs> dick. <laughs> Shelby was a reported suspect because she'd been angry with Taylor for her belief that he deflowered her daughter. Once Charlotte Shelby learned of this, she started several arguments with Taylor for getting too close to her daughter. Shelby's relationship with her daughter was already strained to begin with, and it's conceivable that there was jealousy that she was losing her daughter to an older man. According to some accounts, Shelby had even threatened to kill Taylor on more than one occasion if he got too close to Mary again. Both an author of a book on the case, as well as a film director who planned to adapt the case into a film, believe that Shelby is the most likely culprit. If you'll recall, police speculated that Taylor was shot during an embrace. Perhaps that embrace was a faux olive branch extended by Shelby to Taylor to lure him into a trap. Mm. She's the only one I could see who would have fake hugged him so she could shoot him. Yeah, yeah. Because maybe it's like bury the hatchet, it's okay that you're dating my daughter, I approve, you're dead. That's pretty good, I like this lady as a suspect. I, a lot of people like her as a suspect. Yeah. God, I love the hug murder. <laughs> That's good. It is, Especially right? if it's her, you know, I'm, I'm picturing like Angelica Houston. Yeah. You know, just sort of embrace, you know, just, just embracing, and then just eyes. And then, yeah, while their hand is there, putting her hand back, taking oh, the gun good. from the back. Yeah. It doesn't even seem very logical or effective, I feel like you're more likely to shoot yourself. But, yeah. you know, old Hollywood, she was a stage mom. She liked theatricality. There were rumors that Shelby and District Attorney Woolwine were friends and perhaps romantically interested in one another, opening the door for some to suspect a cover-up. She's just sleeping with the detective? 
The district attorney. District attorney? Yeah. They were just like, a dame, huh? <laughs> I guess I'll cover up a murder for her, as long as she's smooching me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Push yeah. a bunch of files into the garbage, yeah. and that's a cover-up. Cover what you can. Let's yeah. make some more pictures. Yeah. She seems the most likely suspect to me. On that, we, we agree. The only thing that's weird about Charlotte Shelby being the culprit mm -hmm. is that the McLean saw a white male leave the apartment around the time of the gunshot. I mean, there could have been two people there. I guess she could have hired someone to do the whacking for her. That's true. William Desmond Taylor's high-profile murder continues to baffle. An intertwined web of stardom, lust, jealousy, and rage set against the backdrop of the false facade of glitz and glamour in an immoral Hollywood. In the end, all we can do is take a guess as to who was truly responsible. But for now, the case remains unsolved. This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we covered the mysterious disappearance of Louis Le Prince. This is one of my favorite cases we've ever covered. It's got pretty much everything you'd want. It's got mystery, it's got history, and it's got a train. You're a big train guy? Yeah, I'm a big fan of train mysteries. They're uh, among my favorites. Well, in that case, all aboard! All right, I'm not as excited anymore, but let's, let's get into it. Any casual cinema fan would likely tell you that Thomas Edison invented the motion picture camera in the late 1800s. In 1888, Thomas Edison wrote, quote, I am experimenting upon an instrument which does for the eye what the phonograph does for the ear, which is the recording and reproduction of things in motion, end quote. Being a film student myself, I learned about Edison in film school, but what if I told you the true father of moving pictures may actually be a brilliant Frenchman named Louis Le Prince? You might say, well, if this were true, then why have I never heard of him? Maybe you were never supposed to. Because on one fateful afternoon on Monday, September 16th, 1890, Louis Le Prince would step onto a train and never be seen again. A vanishing that would essentially wipe him from the history books Let's start from the beginning. Louis Le Prince was born in the northeastern city of Metz, France on August 28, 1841. Louis was a student of art, chemistry, and physics. In 1866, Louis moved to Leeds, England to work as an agent at a brass foundry called Whitley Partners. In 1869, Louis married a fellow artist, Elizabeth Lizzie Whitley. In 1881, Louis, Lizzie, and their children moved to New York it's here that Louis would manage artists painting panoramic landscapes. These immersive paintings would inspire Louis to create an even more immersive experience, pictures that moved. Interesting that that would be the impetus for that if, if it was just him feeling immersed in it. Exactly. He was like, how can, I, how can I bring this up a level, you know? And that's how you know he was a true artist. And that's why I respect this man. Yeah, I was gonna say, this guy sounds like a real lover of film. Louis began working on moving pictures as early as 1885, inventing a camera with 16 lenses that he hoped could create what we now call movies. It's thought that Louis began building and testing an early version of his single lens camera soon after. According to Louis's daughter Marie, who was a teenager at the time, she recalled seeing her father project moving images on a wall in their workshop as early as 1886. This was long before Thomas Edison had even begun conceptualizing motion picture designs about two years later. In 1886, Louis applied for a United States patent for his 16 lens camera that included brief phrasing, allowing for a single lens version. This process would take nearly two years. In 1887, Louis moved back to Leeds, a move that, according to a New York Times article, was motivated by a desire to hide out from those who might steal his work, such as, quote, industrial spies, end quote, as his wife Lizzie would describe them. Can you imagine if your, your dad just invented something completely unknown to the world, and you just have a memory, like, if you, had a hazy memory of your father flying around the living room. Like a, like a jetpack? 
Yeah, if your father, well, if your living father, room. the living room. Yeah, had or if he had like uh, hover shoes or something, he was flying, and you were like, like the Jetsons? I have this vague memory of my father flying around the living room. <laughs> he was, he was vacuuming the living room, and he was doing it while levitating over the ground. Well, because at that point, movies weren't a thing, so she had this memory of this thing that was wholly unknown to the world. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty amazing. Yeah, and then also add on to that the layer of. But no one knows he invented it. Mm -hmm. In 1888, Louis built what would be his true claim to being the father of moving pictures, a working version of the single lens motion picture camera. It was wooden, mahogany, and weighed 40 pounds. It had a hand crank that manually moved light sensitive paper along between the lens and shutter. Here's Tony Booth of the National Science and Media Museum in the UK on Louis' single lens camera. Quote, if you look at the mechanism that camera is using, it's a very similar mechanism to all the subsequent moving image cameras that came after that. It is a single roll of film moving from one spool to another through a shutter and taking sequential images, which then were designed to be projected to reproduce that movement. As a piece of moving image recording live action, yes, I would say he was the first one to do that." End quote. Oh, very funny also, I feel like we don't often pay enough attention to the fact that we still call them movies. Mm -hmm. It's a funny word. It's a funny word. It's like you... calling your teeth chewies or shoes <laughs> steppies. <laughs> or We're going to go to the movies. Or pens righties. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. A righty. When you think about it, that's kind of a horrible name. Like if someone was like, what should we call this moving picture? And if someone went, movies. We'll go to the movies. Louis' single lens camera would produce viewable films in 1888 three of which have survived. One of these films, which you're seeing now, was claimed to have been shot on October 14th, 1888, showing Louis's son, in-laws, and a friend walking around. The date of October 14th, 1888 is backed up by the fact that one of the women shown in the film died 10 days later on October 24th, 1888. Keep in mind, Edison's earliest film wouldn't even be shot until nearly three years later in 1891. That's a motion picture. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. See? Three years earlier, he had that. And yet, lost a time. The Prince. Though Louis had a working camera, the problem Louis now faced was that he needed A, a way to show these films, and B, a more durable material than his light-sensitive paper in order to plan for repeated projections of his movies. He experimented and finally landed on celluloid in 1889, which he had began using for both shooting and projection. This eliminated many of the problems he'd been having with his projector, such as glass plates that kept breaking. Louis made early, unofficial demonstrations of his device. On March 30th, 1890, Louis projected his moving pictures at the National Opera in Paris. Ferdinand Mobison, secretary of the National Opera, swore in an affidavit that he had witnessed what the projector could do and had even, quote, made a complete study of this system, end quote. Meanwhile, Edison would not publicly show his motion pictures until three and a half years later. In the summer of 1890, Louis wrote to Lizzie, who was back in New York with the rest of the family. In the letter, Louis stated his intent to return to New York in September, where he would publicly and officially demonstrate his moving pictures to the world. It's just, it seems to be going so well for him at this point. I know. He's got, the world is his oyster. He's on the verge of becoming a millionaire. I don't know if there's anything that's more sad than feeling positive momentum and knowing inevitably it's gonna land, uh, it's gonna lead to off a cliff. You're, you're, you could see the drop off coming. Mm. At this point, Louis had been granted patents in France and Britain that covered his single lens motion picture camera. However, none of the patents were thorough enough to legally proclaim him as the inventor of a working version. If Louis were able to publicly demonstrate his moving pictures in New York as planned, Louis surely would have secured his spot in history, legally, as the inventor of the motion picture camera. As bad luck would have it, this brings us to his disappearance. At the time, Louis was visiting his brother Albert Le Prince in Dijon, France. On September 16, 1890, at 2.37 p.m., Louis Le Prince boarded a train for Paris as part of a trip back to Leeds, where he would retrieve his film devices 
and then travel back to New York to meet his family and show his invention. With him, Louis only carried a black suitcase. According to Christopher Rollins, author of a book on the case, the suitcase contained some rather important documents. Inside the suitcase was Louis's latest work on his patents. At the time, Louis was still tweaking his patents on his single lens camera to further protect himself from the theft of his inventions, as Louis's assistant Frederick Mason would remind reporters decades later. Not only did Louis disappear, but the suitcase did as well. All efforts to find Louis failed. Louis Le Prince, carrying paperwork meant to protect his creation, boarded a train to share his invention with the world and vanished. Just going missing on this one day is the difference between you and I never hearing of him and everybody in the world knowing his name. That's crazy. Makes That's it value a day, huh? Shortly after Louis's disappearance, a family associate would enter Louis's workshop and discover Louis's machine safe, packed for the journey to America, untouched. Unfortunately, in a missing persons case, nobody, not even a spouse, is allowed to use the missing persons patent for seven years, meaning Louis's wife Lizzie would be unable to commercialize Louis's invention until 1897. But as mentioned before, Edison displayed his kinetoscope movies in 1894 and projected his films as early as April 1896. As history would tell, Edison would often be credited with inventing the motion picture camera, and Louis would be forgotten. Okay, now I have a question. Jesus Christ. I suddenly, I suddenly wonder, maybe Edison simply heard about this fanciful, inventive man mm -hmm. with his wonderful machine yeah. that was hands off for seven years, and it put the idea in his head, oh, he's a clearly a capable man, Edison wasn't inspired by Louis, though. He was inspired by um, imagery. Or well, what if that's just what he said? Obviously, if you ask Edison what inspired you, he's not going to be like, oh, the guy who made it before me. The guy I fucking stole it from. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> what a dumb question. <laughs> <laughs> then he twirls his mustache and backs out of the room. Yeah. Well, I just thought if, if he was aware of it, I wouldn't put it past him to be able, once he realizes, oh, what, you just shoot a bunch of pictures back to back? Yeah, reverse, it. En you reverse engineer an idea. Reverse engineer. He, he was smart enough of a guy to do that. And he, sure. had the, he had the resources. Mm -hmm. He had probably the know-how. So I could see him just essentially s stealing the idea and, like you said, reverse engineer. With that, let's get into the theories. The first theory is that Louis was abducted or killed by men working for none other than Thomas Edison. This theory was held by Louis's wife, Lizzie, who believed Edison's motive was to stop Louis's invention from reaching the public. The timelines certainly do match up. In 1888, Edison began to seriously think about moving pictures, while by that time, Louis had already successfully shot films with his single lens camera. Behind the scenes, Thomas Edison was said to be an egotistical genius, though a good deal of his success was built on taking credit for others' ideas, such as the ideas of people that he employed. Edison had many rivals, and he even ruined some of them, but he was pretty adept at doing so through legal battles. He frequently claimed others were encroaching on his patents, and often won these lawsuits and used the leverage to his financial benefit. So, mm. A bit cowardly. A lot the, of the litigious approach. He made a lot of his money off of doing this. Actually, yeah. I would say a majority of his money he made off of just suing people. Scoundrel. Piggybacking off that, in 1898, Edison sued American Mutoscope and Biograph Company on the grounds of patent infringement on his kinetoscope motion picture camera patent. This lawsuit would ironically bring Louis Le Prince into the spotlight, as Mutoscope would call Louis's son Adolphe Le Prince as one of its witnesses. Adolphe actually took a year off from Columbia to travel and gather evidence to make the case that his father invented the motion picture camera, not Edison, as Edison was claiming. According to Rollins, Lizzie and other family members still held on to the possibility that Louis was being held captive, having been kidnapped in 1890, and that that once it was known in a court of law that he was the true inventor of the motion picture camera, his captors would let him go. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Who captured him? Well, they think that Louis Le Prince was kidnapped by maybe Edison or some other inventor, 
and the only reason why they were holding him captive was because no one knew he existed. So but if his name was brought into the spotlight in this legal battle, mm -hmm. maybe the captors would let him go. It's a, it's a somewhat, uh, I think it's a somewhat logical thought, but a very sad thought. It's a very sad thought because it sounds like they're just... Grasping at straws. Yeah, it's it's a kind of a bummer. But it's, a, it's just it's a big straw. Desperately hoping that their father is still alive. Yeah. During the trial, Adolfi proved the films had been made prior to October 24th, 1888, by producing his grandmother's death certificate dated on that day, as she appears in one of the films. Yet, this wasn't totally incontrovertible proof that the single lens camera built by Louis was the same one that took the films in 1888. When examining Louis' patents, the lawyers in the case focused solely on Louis' US patent, and sadly for Louis, this particular patent, unlike his ones in Britain and France, was meant mainly for his previous 16 lens camera, and did not include specifications for the single lens camera, the camera being focused on in the trial. By bad luck, the phrase, quote, one or more lenses, end quote, which would have covered both of Louis' inventions, was removed by the US Patent Office on the grounds that they already had granted a patent for a single lens camera in the past. Though, that particular patent was for a still camera, not a motion picture camera like Louis's. This omission would prove to be disastrous in trial. I can't blame them for that, though. It's something they've never heard of. They're probably like, uh, whoa, you want to patent a camera? Oh, what are you gonna try and patent boots next? Get out of here with that. <laughs> I guess. But I mean, if you just looked at the rest of the patent, it was clear that it was for a motion picture camera. Well, maybe he I'm not saying the US patent in office was in on this. I'm just saying it's bad luck. I also feel like maybe he should have discussed it with them. He did for two years. For two years? He said, put that phrase back in he, the- he went, he went back and forth with them for two years. And they finally settled on it. And they were, he was like, I guess at that point he was worn out. He's like, fine, take out the phrase. Well, again, that's his fault. I mean, you got to get a pad and s s dug his own grave. The trial would initially go for Edison. And over the years, the trial would go back and forth, starting the famed patent wars. As such, Adolphe's testimony would move out of focus and his father, Louis Le Prince, would once again be forgotten. Perhaps tangentially related, in 1901, three years after Adolphe testified, Adolphe was found dead in the woods, bloody and broken. He had apparently been shot dead. He had been out shooting and a gun was found by his side. It was assumed he died of a hunting accident. Some believed it was suicide, while some in the family believed he'd been murdered. What do you think about that? You know, this is at a time in, in history when, when murders were just, just that. Just that. Oh well. He just happened to uh, testify in trial on one of the oh, I'm biggest saying, patent cases I'm of all I'm saying it's very likely he was murdered, but it doesn't matter because it's, what, the 19, 1900 or so? 19... Who, who gives a shit? <laughs> <laughs> a detective goes out there with a magnifying glass, goes, he was shot. He was shot, likely by someone else. However, in regards to Edison playing any part in foul play regarding Louis or even Adolphe, Authors John Jock Ulas and Jock Fend point out that there is no evidence to support this theory. For what it's worth, Lori Snyder, Louis's great great granddaughter, has also voiced her doubts that Edison, a busy and successful man, would care enough to send a henchman to kill a man. The second theory is that Albert Le Prince, Louis's brother, was responsible for Louis's disappearance. Louis's brother Albert, an architect, was notably the only person who claimed to have seen Louis board the train. According to Rollins, Albert even spoke to Louis through his train compartment window. However, the 1890 investigation never turned up a single train passenger who could say they saw Louis on board. This is odd, considering the fact that Louis was a gargantuan man, standing at six foot four, probably not a man that could get lost in a crowd. I don't know how many six four fellows there were walking around at that time, but I will say that when I get on a train, I'm not focused on other passengers. No, you're reading the funnies or, uh, you know. And especially in old time trains, when yeah. you're in compartments. You're like in the Harry Potter train. You're thinking about the, uh, the candy cart coming by. You're not thinking about, oh, I wonder if someone here is going to get murdered. Maybe I may have to tell details of it later. Also, I think there's some value to the fact that everybody's clothes looked the same back then. Like, everyone was probably wearing just a black suit or something. There's no one walking around in a like a hornet starter jacket. Yeah. I just think 
I thought this was a good opportunity for you as a fellow Lord of the Rings tree to provide some They're insights. They're called Ents. Whatever. Perhaps the main reason some are suspicious of Albert involves the will of Louis and Albert's mother, who passed away in 1887. Albert was the executor of their mother's will, and according to author Christopher Rollins, Louis had traveled to Dijon, France, not just to visit Albert, but to receive his share of the inheritance, worth over $140,000 by today's standards. This gets even more interesting when you consider the investigators in 1890 did not seem to know about the inheritance, which would give Albert a motive. And furthermore, they did not seem to question Albert's testimony regarding seeing Louis board the train. Laurie Snyder, Louis's great-great-granddaughter, once again doubts this theory, basing her beliefs on Lizzie LePrince's memoirs, which depict a close, loving family. Authors Ulas and Fend also note that there is no evidence to support this theory, and emphasize that Albert's family strongly denies it. All right. I just don't buy it, and I'll tell you why. Okay. There's nothing that I looked into that proves Albert Le Prince was, any was in any dire financial straits. I was going to say, is there a need for money there? There isn't. So, yeah. Why would he all of a sudden decide, oh, I want some extra bucks. Let's, let me kill my let brother. Let me kill my brother and ruin his family by <laughs> taking, stripping him of his greatest invention. He killed him during life and after death then at that point. Yeah. yeah they say to, a man dies twice. You know... Story-wise, I could see why some people believe this, sure. But when you when you really just think about it, nah. It's a I, little too soap opera. I'm not yeah, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. Okay, great. I'm not. You don't have to. I'm good. Good. It's not purchased. It's on the shelf. It's gonna stay there. I'm not selling it. I, I didn't say you were selling it. Someone is. And I'm not buying it. I'm this is a, this metaphor is, where, where are we in this? I don't know. The final theory is perhaps the bleakest, that Louis Le Prince simply didn't want to be found. This is the theory of Louis's great nephew, who is the grandson of Albert. The theory goes that Louis was greatly in debt to the tune of $84,000 by today's standards. During the mid 1870s, Louis gave a bad loan to Lizzie's family business that didn't pan out. Toward the end, the dual income of Louis and Lizzie had to not only provide for the family, but also finance Louis's film experiments. And according to author Christopher Rollins, Louis hadn't worked steadily for an income for about three years leading up to his disappearance. In April 1890, Louis wrote to Lizzie about problems with the projector, adding, quote, I hope to send the word, it is, in my next, and also some cash, which unfortunately I have not at hand and it makes me feel very uneasy, as I know you do not make much just now." End quote. It's been suggested that in the end, Louis relied on his mother's inheritance in order to continue working on his projector, but learned during his trip to France that he didn't have immediate access to the money. Of Louis's breakout invention, some, like author Christopher Rollins, believe that Louis, a noted perfectionist, felt his projector was not up to the standards he had envisioned. His letters offer evidence that Louis was unhappy with the quality of the projector's picture. It was bright and the picture was jumpy. According to Rollins, it's possible that Louis just got off the train between Dijon and Paris rather than face his family in defeat. For people who believe this, people that believe maybe he wasn't pleased with his projector, mm -hmm. I think they're lacking perspective. You gotta remember, people didn't even know what the phrase moving picture meant. So regardless of whether or not the picture was jumpy, he, sh he shows up to this event, he shows a picture that starts moving, people are gonna think this guy's a goddamn wizard. Yeah. They're, gonna, they're, gonna, they're not gonna be like, oh bro, the quality's bad, it's not 1080p, I don't fucking get it. I've, I existed back in this time and I saw a moving picture, I'd probably think his camera was bewitched. I'd kiss him on the, on the lips. I'd, I'd like, say, sir, you've done it. I'm just saying, it's stupid for people to think that he was maybe feeling a little uneasy about his projector, so he decided, I'm just gonna jump off this train now. Frederick Mason, Louis's assistant, believed that Louis would only stand to gain from his inventions, which would thus make it nonsensical for him to intentionally disappear on the cusp of his debut. 
David Wilkinson, a producer on a documentary on Louis, said, quote, I am absolutely convinced that he would have raised money from a very distinguished audience so then he could start manufacturing on quite a big scale. He would have done what Edison and the Lumieres did, but before them, he would have been known, end quote. After hearing Louis' story, I can't help but agree. Had Louis successfully shown his work in New York, Louis Le Prince would have been a name that I read in textbooks as a film student, but unfortunately, that never happened. The reason behind that will tragically elude us for the foreseeable future. I think it was Edison's goons. I think it was either Edison's goons or some version of goons, whether they're Edison's or some other creator, maybe, I don't know, I mean, Lumiere Brothers seemed less likely, but there were other creators who were onto the motion picture The camera. Lumiere Brothers were just whimsical. They didn't, they weren't like, let's kill this man. I think it's because their name sounds whimsical. Yeah, they remind me of the candlestick from Beauty and the Beast. Oh, Lumiere. Yes. Yeah, good catch. Uh, on the pen and on the reference. Anyways. Yeah, I think it was some version of goons. My money's on Edison. They could have been any goons. I think this man was uh, stripped from glory right at the cusp of it. But maybe now people will know his name. For what it's worth, if someone were to ask me, who's the true father of moving pictures? I'd say Louis Le Prince. But as for his disappearance, I can only offer theories as the case of Louis Le Prince will remain unsolved. This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we cover the case of the Jameson family, a case that's as odd as it is creepy. Uh, there's a lot of weird circumstance that surround this one. Uh, it's in the woods. Uh, there's some images in here that keep you wondering. The woods are intriguing. Last time we were in the woods was the uh, Keddie cabins. Yeah, I didn't like that. I didn't care for it. Well, let's get into it. On October 8th, 2009, the Jameson family, comprised of Bobby Dale Jameson, age 44, Sherilyn Leanne Jameson, age 40, and their six-year-old daughter, Madison Stormy Star Jameson, were seen for the last time before vanishing. The family, who lived in Eufaula, Oklahoma at the time of their disappearance, was last seen by a man who lived in the mountains in southeastern Oklahoma. However, the man told authorities that he only saw the family and nobody else in the area during that time. Officially, the Jamesons were near this area to view a 40-acre plot of land that they were looking to purchase. Bizarrely, they planned to live on that land in a storage container that they already owned on their current property in Eufaula. I, I know a lot of people who do that, tiny houses. You seen the tiny houses movement? I don't think they were the tiny house type. Well, a storage container is tiny. They're going to live in it. But and you're thinking make it their of it being like uh, decked out, like with beautiful decor, a uh, 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 cool use of the space. Yeah. I think this was like, let's throw some sleeping bags in there kind of situation. That's it? I'm just saying if it's nice enough to say, hey, we're bringing this uh, container all the way over from our old plot of land, clearly there was something about that container that was maybe luxurious or maybe customized or. Okay, sure. You know, yeah, that's decked fair. out. That's fair. Yeah. Okay, that's fair. I'll take it. Thanks. On October 16th, Eight days after the Jamesons were last seen alive, the first major discovery in the case occurred. Hunters in a remote location in the woods, about a quarter mile away from the Jamesons last known location, discovered the Jamesons truck, abandoned and still locked. Inside the truck, investigators found Bobby's wallet, Sherilyn's purse, jackets, a GPS, Bobby's cell phone, $32,000 cash in a bank bag stashed below the driver's seat, and finally, the Jameson's pet dog, Maisie, who was malnourished and incredibly still alive. Bobby's cell phone found in the truck contained a photo of his daughter, Madison, 
which was believed to have been taken the day before they disappeared. One key observation was that the truck showed no evidence of any kind of struggle. Former Latimer County Sheriff Israel Beecham would eventually state, quote, I think they were forced to stop and got out of the truck to meet with someone they recognize, and I think they either left willingly or by force, end quote. Signs that point to them maybe leaving on their own accord would be, they seem possibly like off the grid types. If they're living in a storage container. Though, if you were leaving willingly, why wouldn't you take your dog with you? That's what I'm saying is against the willingly, which would make me think it was against their will, is if someone had them at gunpoint, maybe they'd leave the dog. Because you bring that dog with you, it can, yeah. that's very handy in a survival situation, depending on what kind of dog it, it is. Also, at gunpoint, you're not really in the position to make demands. You can't be like, could I bring my dog, though? What about Maisie? The GPS unit in the truck indicated that the family had been farther up a nearby hill prior to the location where their truck and belongings were found. Investigators followed the GPS coordinates, and it's there that they found footprints. One day later, on October 17th, over 300 people, including authorities and volunteers, formed a large-scale air and ground search party. Unfortunately, the leads went cold, and the search for the Jamesons was called off. Which brings us to the case's second major and unfortunate discovery on November 16th, 2013. were out scouting for deer hunting locations in the deep woods when they stumbled upon the partial skeletal remains of three bodies of two adults and one child. The remains were discovered less than three miles away from where the Jamesons had disappeared over four years earlier. The search by officials that followed would uncover shoes, bits of clothing, adult teeth, an adult arm and leg bones, and bone fragments. The bones would eventually be confirmed as the missing Jameson family. I mean, they don't know how long they were out there? Uh, I, I guess not, because you would think they would have found it in the initial search, because if it was only, you know, it was less than three miles away from the truck, you know. Though I've said this before, the wilderness is big. The wilderness is big. The wilderness is big. But you miss things. I guess, but not when you have a starting point. A radius of five miles, anything within that. You think maybe they were hiding when when the search was going on? Oh, for, maybe for up people? On, climbed a tree or something? Why would they do that? The Oklahoman State Medical Examiner, Dr. Joshua Lanter, reported that a cause and manner of death were unknown, possibly due to the fact that the skeletal remains weren't complete. Lanter stated that there was no evidence of trauma, though it couldn't be fully ruled out due to the incomplete remains. Lanter also could not rule out disease, there was also evidence of posthumous damage by animals. Lanter's final report on the case states the deaths occurred under suspicious circumstances. I, this is a morbid thought, but I've always thought that it would be nice to be um, given back. Oh, to the earth? Like a recycling kind of thought? Yeah, just have vultures pick me apart or something. That's... Well, that, after I die, I don't want to. Well, I, mean, I don't want to be like, oh, I'm feeling old. Let me go lay out in the sun. <laughs> no, I'm not. But what I was when you said that, I was picturing dying and then my body slowly and beautifully decomposing into the ground. I want no. But I want animals to be tearing at my meat, sort of like tug of war. With you my, want a vulture picking at your eyeballs? It's kind of neat. Other items worth mentioning from the investigation are a missing briefcase and a missing 22 caliber handgun registered to Sherilyn Jameson, both of which were never found. Let's provide some background on the two Jameson parents, Bobby and Sherilyn. Both Bobby and Sherilyn were not working at the time of their disappearance due to disabilities and were receiving disability checks. Bobby was on disability due to being in a car accident. The one thing worth noting is that Sherilyn's mother, Connie Kokotan, stated that she did not know of any settlement from the car accident that might explain the $32,000 in cash found in the Jameson's truck. Neither Kokotan nor anybody else know where this money came from. 
former sheriff Israel Beecham, while on the investigation, stated that there, quote, doesn't appear to be any signs that the Jamesons were in trouble or looking to start a new life, end quote. One odd wrinkle to the case was security footage taken outside the Jameson home. The footage, according to Daily Mail, was from the day that they left and showed the couple making several silent trips between the car and their home as they methodically packed to leave. They were moving in a manner that Beecham described as, quote, trance-like. On the video, sometimes they would just stop and stare. If I'm packing all my things and I'm getting ready to leave my life behind, go off the grid, that's mm. a big commitment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if I'm loading up my car, and you know, like, oh boy, this is it, I'm probably gonna be a little trance-like, and in the middle of it, I might stop. Have a couple pregnant pauses. Look at the sunset, think, what am I doing? What am I doing, man? Beecham also said, quote, normally, you can go through an investigation and one by one start to eliminate certain scenarios. We haven't been able to do that in this case. With this family, everything seems possible, end quote. And with that, let's get into the theories. The first theory is that the family simply got lost in the woods and died from hypothermia and exposure. In the days following their disappearance, the area where the Jamesons were last seen experienced heavy rains, albeit not rain strong enough to cause their deaths. A glance at the farmer's almanac for weather reports in the area at that time showed temperatures of merely 40 degrees at the coldest. As a reminder, the bodies were found only 2.7 miles from their truck. If you're two miles away from your car and you go, oh, it was that way, I know that. If you pick even the slightest wrong direction, suddenly you're way off the mark. Why would they leave their cell phone, all their possessions, things that you could use to then get back to your car? These do seem like people that may be wilderness savvy. Well, doesn't sound oh, like oh, it. No. Oh, no, I'm talking about it. They're looking in that area. They're looking at a plot of land to maybe live yeah. in a storage container. You but they didn't have anything on them, right? Did they have compasses? Did they have maps? No, and that's to me. that to me means they didn't intend to go on a trip. Mm. If, if the little daughter got spooked by something, she started running. They ran after her because obviously, holy shit, our daughter. How fast could a daughter run? She's going to run 2.7 miles before they catch her? I don't know if she was trying to get away from them. How, how fast is a six-year-old? What is she, the fucking Flash? The second theory is that the Jameson's demise was a murder-suicide scenario. The investigation would turn up a suspicious letter that according to one report was 11 pages long and was found in the Jameson's abandoned truck. The letter is what was called a hate letter written from Sherilyn to Bobby, in which she accused him of being a hermit. Another letter that was said to mention death was also found in the family home. According to former Sheriff Beecham, quote, they were certainly a family obsessed with death, end quote. However, Sherilyn's mother has repeatedly stated that Bobby and Sherilyn were good parents. Quote, like I've said from the very beginning, I think somebody killed them. There's just no way that Bobby and Sherilyn would ever let anything happen to Madison unless something had been done to them. You, got, you have some marital disputes, that seems minor. I 11 don't... pages is a lot of pages, but. Yeah, but if like the worst thing you say in it is, you're a hermit. Yeah. Also, if you're gonna murder somebody in the woods, why bring your daughter with you? Yes, though if you're murdering someone, you're probably not in the right frame of mind to begin with. I suppose, but the mom doesn't think so. Also, it's noteworthy that the mom lived with them for a certain amount of time. Oh, she did. So she would have reference of how they behaved. Yeah. Which brings us to our third theory, that the Jamesons were murdered by Bobby Jameson's 67-year-old father, Bob Dean Jameson. Earlier in 2009, approximately six months before the family disappeared, Bobby had filed a protective order against his father. Allegedly, Bob had threatened to kill Bobby and his family on two separate occasions, in November 2008 and April 2009. In the petition, Bobby did not detail how his father had made the threats. He did write that Bob had, quote, hit me with his vehicle, end quote, on November 1st, 2008. Bobby also wrote that Bob was a, quote, very dangerous man who thinks he is above the law, end quote, and that he'd been involved with, quote, prostitutes, gangs, and meth, end quote. Doesn't look good. That's not good. No. That's bad. I mean, that's, I don't, I mean, that definitely gives motive, and it does seem like Seems like the kind of guy who might do that on it also account of he threatened to murder. Yeah, it does seem like this wasn't a case like, oh, I couldn't see this coming. It was many warnings were given. Furthermore, Bobby stated in his petition, 
quote, my entire family is severely scared for their lives, end quote, end quote, I am in fear at all times, end quote. Testimonies were given in the case, and a judge dismissed the protective order on May 18th, 2009. Bobby Jameson was also in the process of suing his father at the time of the Jameson family's disappearance. The gist of the suit was that Bobby would sometimes work for free at his father's gas station, where half the sales had been promised to Bobby but were never paid. Though, Bobby and Sherilyn had been described as, quote, scammers, end quote, by former Sheriff Beecham, as they had also previously sued three others in 2005 after a car accident. Moreover, Jack Jameson, Bob Dean's brother and Bobby's uncle claimed that while Bob Dean was, quote, disturbed at the time, end quote, Jack was, quote, pretty sure he was not capable of being involved in that, end quote. You, you wish these stories had a black and white to them. Yeah, right, every time you think this is clear cut, like now you got this poor family, turns in, you know, they turn up in the woods, you feel for them, and now suddenly they're casting doubt upon their characters because they're, what, they're scammers? Apparently, they're according, scammers. according to the sheriff. That's his opinion. And now we can't even trust the sheriff because you're casting doubt on him. Well, I don't know. I mean, he seems like a, a, a legitimate investigator. I don't, he doesn't have any uh, motive in this to, you know, have a cover up. I hate these stories, Ryan. <laughs> no. Bob Dean died in December 2009. Jack Jameson, like Sherilyn's mother, still suspects that foul play played a part in the Jameson family's death. This brings us to our bizarre fourth theory that the Jamesons were murdered by a cult. Sherilyn's mother, Connie Kokatan, believes the Jamesons were killed by a religious cult in southeastern Oklahoma. According to Kokatan, the cult had a quote, hit list, end quote, that Sherilyn was on. After Investigation Discovery aired a special on the Jameson family on the show Disappeared, Sherilyn's close friend, Nikki Chenold, said she received a phone call from an anonymous woman. This woman reportedly told Chenold that she'd once been in a white supremacy group that kept a book containing a list of people who'd been problems for them. Sometimes, this woman claimed, if she could remember one of the names she had seen, she'd go home and look it up on the internet. This had led her to multiple missing persons cases, including Sherilyn and Bobby Jameson. Chenold said she wasn't sure what to make of the caller. Cults, I don't know. Cults, cults are out there. I wouldn't initially just refute it outright. No, it just sounds outrageous, given like everything else in this seems very much, you know, par for the course when it comes to uh, cold cases, right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, here's this cult. A 1993 article in the Oklahoman stated that a few cults had sprung up around eastern Oklahoma, though a U.S. Marshal named James Webb had added, quote, there hasn't been any activity in a couple of years, end quote. It's also been suggested that the Jamesons were into witchcraft. A, quote, witch Bible, end quote, was reportedly found in the Jameson home. Though, Nikki Chenold claims that Sherilyn Jameson bought the witch Bible as a joke. That being said, their pastor in Eufaula, Gary Brandon, claims Bobby confessed that he was reading a, quote, satanic Bible, end quote. Additionally, mysterious graffiti was found on the large storage container kept on the Jameson's property. One line read, quote, three cats killed to date by people in this area. Witches don't like their black cat killed, end quote. There was a witch Bible found in their house, which was written off as a joke, sure. But then the husband- Funny, funny joke. But the husband- ha, ha, Look at this, <laughs> a witch Bible. But then the husband himself has admitted he was reading a satanic Bible, so obviously it was not a joke. If Maybe she is, brought the witch Bible home and was like, ha witch Bible, uh, witch Bible, waka waka. And then he was like, ah, pretty good joke, honey. Let me read that. Oh, and then late at night, mm. when she's sleeping, he- and she was like, little... what are you reading? And he was like, ha ha, ha funny book. Sherilyn's mother also reported some odd behavior from her daughter. Quote, she became very illogical. One day she drove me to Oklahoma City and dropped me off on the street. She told me, get out of my car. So I did, end quote. Get out of my car. Yeah, I was like the T-1000 right there. Get out. <laughs> you don't Me do that to your mother. No, I mean, and that could be other factors, but could it also be because she was maybe in a daze? 
Yeah. You know, your, your head gets kind of lost in the fog when you're involved with some shady business, I yeah. suppose. Also, I my mom was the kind of mom who, if I said that to her, first she'd smack me, yeah. and secondly, I'd have to get out. So Yeah, my mom once stopped the car and told me and my brother to get out. Oh, she said, no, we're just kidding. We're not fighting. What did you do to prompt that response? I think we were just like, just fucking hitting each other in the back seat or something. Yeah. You know, classic brother stuff. And of course, the main evidence of strange behavior was the aforementioned security tape where the two Jameson parents appeared to be in a, quote, trance-like state, end quote. The Jamesons also reportedly claimed to have two to four ghosts in their home. Father Gary Brandon even told investigators that Bobby Jameson had once called him asking about, quote, special bullets, end quote, that could be used to shoot spirits. You're not related to this guy in any way? <laughs> you looked that up? No. No, but I, I thought, I don't know if that belongs in the cult theory. Maybe they're in a religious cult where they believe that sort of thing. Doesn't matter. It I'm glad it, you included it. It does contribute to odd behavior. And for the record, I don't believe in special bullets. Which brings us to our fifth and final theory, that drugs were involved. All of the aforementioned strange behavior from the Jameson parents could be explained by the influence of drugs. There were actually rumors that the Jameson parents were involved with drugs, and some believe that the family was involved in a drug deal gone awry. As reported by the Oklahoman in May 2010, Sherilyn's mother, who didn't believe drugs were involved, said the couple had been in financial straits. Pure speculation here, but maybe the $32,000 in cash had something to do with the possible deal, as it makes no sense how the Jamesons had that money, let alone in the car they disappeared from. People didn't know where the money came from. Mm -hmm. If they were making money off of some kind of it would drug be situation, the it would be, they're not keeping wreck, they're not taking it to the bank and saying, no. this is from the meth that I just sold. They're not reporting that to the IRS. Right. Police initially suspected drugs after viewing the strange security footage, but former Sheriff Beecham said there was no evidence backing up the theory that the Jamesons used or dealt drugs. Yet, he also stated he could not rule out the possibility that drugs could have been somehow involved in the disappearance. To be fair, many have pointed out that the Jamesons likely would not have taken six-year-old Madison with them if some kind of drug-related event was taking place. That's fair. That's fair. I mean, why would you take your daughter to a drug deal? Don't do drugs, don't do drug deals. Don't <laughs> take your children to any of the drugs or the drug deals. Every time in this case, I think I've come to some kind of logical conclusion, I'm sadly mistaken. Would it be easy though for them to cover up the evidence of their involvement with drugs? What if they were going to perhaps buy some drugs. In that case, someone shows up who's allegedly going to give them drugs. They've got the money that they're going to give to that person, though I don't know why that person didn't take the money. Oh, and there's our daughter in the backseat. So Maybe the person was like, I'm not doing this, not with her around. So instead, I'm going to kill all three of you and leave the money. Maybe they just chased him. But I can't wrap my head around the cash being left there and then the daughter being there. That doesn't make any sense. Maybe the person didn't know the cash was there. But they're going to a drug deal. Of course they would know the cash is there. Maybe they tried giving them the briefcase and they didn't realize they didn't put the cash in it. They hand it over, the guy opens it up and he's like, where's the cash? And they go, yipes, and they run into the woods. And then he goes, no need to check the car. So like I said, there's a scary dog in there. Former Sheriff Beecham has said that there were no suspects in the case. While investigating the disappearance, Beecham was quoted as saying, quote, a lot of investigators would love to have as many leads as we do. The problem is that they point in so many different directions, end quote. Perhaps one day, those leads will point in one clear direction. But for now, the case remains unsolved. <laughs>